what you are required to do legally. Right? It's about managing on-site safety in accordance with law and in the context of your job and your responsibility. You just heard it acknowledge being the site supervisor carrying the care of what they want to do. And what you said is what we used to do all the time. Get in the bucket and lowering it to the trench. It used to happen all the time. Right? And he got red carded. And when he gets red carded, he suddenly, although that's what the site manager wanted to do, he got red carded. He carried the cap and he's now unemployed with only no money. Right? He know he, he just said, I ain't doing that. Because it's down to the site manager to provide you decent access. Right? And it's down to him. So, He's a little bit, he was naive about it, and he carried the can and lost his job. How long was you out for? Six months, wasn't it, Lodge? No, I was working there. I was on the site for one and a half years, but um, yeah, I've been out. I'm back in work again, but again, yeah, um, yeah I lost the, bat, I lost the job in, back in November. Yeah. You see, and it cost him money, and in November it's just... Because it, it costs money, because... They... We can't just ignore it. That's the aims of the course. The objectives of the course is obviously to pass the course. Right, to implement all health and safety and welfare environment legislation affecting your daily work activities, implement new guidance and industry best practices because the law has changed from five years ago. Today is the worst day. Right? Don't worry about making notes of anything I'm telling you. When I tell you to make some notes of something, is unfortunately what we're doing now is health and safety law. And it's this most slow, laborious thing. You've got an attention span of about 20 minutes. You'll take in what I say to you for about 20 minutes and switch on. I will try and mix it up to give you as much information as I can in different formats to help you learn. Right? In little chats and so on. When you chat and discuss with me, it helps you to learn. And someone mentioned earlier about the Man City game. We hope to finish around that time anyway, so hopefully you should be in for that anyway. Right? So, um, you see in that welcome email I sent you, I'll log in about an hour before, so I'll log in somewhere around 8 o'clock. You, you've seen your XA6 workbook, it was mentioned at the beginning. Has anybody looked at the XA6 workbook? Uh, yes. I did it briefly. Yeah. I haven't yet. As we talk at the moment, can you all manage to split screen something? Can you all do that? Yeah. Right, so if you can split screen and you open your XC6 workbook, it's a good idea because as we work through today, you will be working through section A. Right? And the same as you doing this is homework. So if you were doing this in a classroom, you would do section A tonight. A little bit of history about how so people know. It started very first started over two hundred years ago, about two hundred and twenty years ago. Uh, it started with a, a thing called the Apprentice Act, right? And it's basically, it's the act for preservation of health and morals of apprentices. And it was the very first act. And basically, what they brought it about, how they brought it about, is because we used to abuse apprentices really badly. And the act went, we've got to do something about this because we've got too many young children dying. Because when you talk about apprentices, you're talking about what age do you think? 16 to 21. Huh? 16 to 21. Yeah. Back in them days, probably about 13, 14. Yeah. Oh, you think, wouldn't you? Right, see, so, yeah, again, right, so, what we did with the Apprentice Act, we was brought in, it was brought in a guy called Bob Hill, and he took a lot of fight and a lot of arguing with the other MPs, and if you know anything, Bob Hill, he went to the police. Basically, how it began, it was to it was to protect the youngsters from dying. And the act basically stated a few things. It's like the employer must have an age certificate for all children. So that's the first thing with birth certificates, like, or CSS card, if you like, whatever you want to call it. But we have to have some sort of proof of their age. No child worker can be employed under the age of nine. Oh. Like, Maximum nine hours days for workers between the age of nine and thirteen. Maximum nine hour days. Maximum twelve hour days for people between thirteen and eighteen. No child, children are allowed to work at night. 
That was the first act, right? That was the Factories Act, if you like. And that was that was what was started out. And the Factories Act, although it was initiated in 1833, it was still around in 1980, you know, 1970s. 1970s, 1980s, it was still around. And we were still applying it, right? Forward wind a couple of hundred years, if you like, and, and we've now got the Health and Safety Work Act that governs all of it. You guys, all you guys ever talk about is CDM. We cover CDM tomorrow. We're doing Health and Safety Law today and the Act and what it does for us. Right? So the Act, also the Factories Act, it, it, we had a lot of mills, a lot of textiles. We had something like 3,000 mills and four inspectors to cover the whole thing in the geographical area of the whole of England. So it was a massive area, a massive lot of, massive lot of work for cotton geese, and only four people to enforce it. And they basically were there to bring it about change. They were bringing about advice. They were bringing about how we control health and safety, where we're doing it, where it's going wrong. Right? This is what they were doing. So basically, we then fast forward. They were the star of the HSE. We're fasting forward and we just keep moving forward. You know, as we move forward around, you know, the 1880s, we then suddenly employ a few more. We get like 35 of them. And then, you know, and it, it, it's, it's been split up. You know, each, res each inspector responsible for his own area. So you might the southwest, the southeast, the north, you know, and so on and so on. So, you know, and that's how it was sort. These were the guys, they were there then not only to enforce, and to prosecute, they were there to advise. So then they started advising, saying, well, that machinery, they really should have guards on. That was the start of Pure, right? And they're saying anyone who's got an, an accident or an injury, he lost his arm, you know, there was some, I, I got a um, HSC bulletin yesterday, I think they, they were on so many million pounds. We, do you know the old plasterers with paddle mixer? I look it up at tea, at tea time, and I look it up. But you know the old panel mixer, I think we find it was either two and a half or five million pounds because mate got his arm, he had to have his arm amputated because he got caught with a panel mixer and it severely damaged his arm and the company was fined two and a half or five million pounds. It was in a, it was yesterday's bulletin that come across to me. But you know and obviously accident reporting, who did we report them to? Did give you earlier. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I H think it. Huh? How does it? Uh, HS. Yeah, lift your mic up a bit because it's struggling to hear you, fellow. Right? HS. Yeah, HS. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, well, mate. Go on, go on, HSC. Go on. Yeah, HSC. Safety executive, right? That's yeah. it. Report. Under what regulations do you report? Riddle. Riddle, yeah. Riddle, riddle, whichever way you say it, whichever way you want to say it. But that's what the regulations are. That's who the reporting body is. Does anybody know the duration of the time before we have to report? Within one year after Ooh. injury? Ooh. <laughs> uh, within a day. Right. I'm not going to go that way because I don't. I don't want to teach you because you won't get questioned on it. Right. You won't get questioned on it. But. There is restrictions on it, and there's certain ones that I want to know. I don't want to go on that one, once because the reason I don't, I don't like to give you information that you're possibly going to get wrong. So I'm going to ignore what you just said there, but as soon as physically possible, right? How long do they have to be off before we report? Will it be a week? Hey? Eh? More than a day. Hey, so if, if someone was ill for a day, you'd have to report. Is that what you're trying to say? Perhaps I'm not rephrasing the question properly. How long would they have to be absent from work for before I have to report? Two weeks. Three days. Three days. Oh, look at that. Two weeks, three days, four days, a year. Come on. Seven days. All right? Seven days, not including the day of the accident. So if they're off for seven days, so it's eight days, all right? But it's, they class it as seven days, not including the daily accident, right? So if someone broke their, let's say someone twisted their ankle, 
at work, which happens quite a lot because we work on a lot of unstable ground and it can be quite a messy place. If they were off for three days and came back to work and said, no, it's right now, we wouldn't have to report it. If they was off for seven days and came back to work, we wouldn't have to report it. If they were off for seven days and the day of the accident, which is eight days, so day of the accident, let that day go past, the next day, seven days, if they were off work for seven days, right, then we'd have to report it. It's a reportable accident. We put in a royal form. We do it now online. We used to do it handwritten, download form. But now it's done online. Put it in, send it off. Right? Who does that? But seven days is a working days or calendar days? It's calendar days. Calendar days, okay. Yeah, it's calendar days because people work weekends as well. Seven normal working days, right? So they normally work the weekend. Will be the weekend as well. Yeah. So, what was what was my question? I forgot what, what my question was because <laughs> somebody who asked me. Who has to fill this, uh, Who has to fill out this form? Yeah. Who has to fill out? Who has to do this reporting? Uh, the um... manager is his employer when he's working for you. Right. So, anyway, let's get back to it. Let's get back to the health and safety legislation. So. Around the 1970s, they, the, a gentleman called the, the Loftus Report, he was asked to report on some, or he was asked to report on the Health and Safety and Work Act, and he was asked to refine it in some way. Right? He, he discovered, right, following an extensive review and a Rubens Report in 72, prompted a new approach to health and safety legislation that introduced the Health and Safety and Work Act 1970. Right. Basically, he said we've got a shitload of regulations that uh, all over the place, and a lot of them cross over each other. Right. Excuse my language, sorry, I do apologize. Right, we've got a lot of regulations that all cross over, and basically we need to refine them in some way. So he devised, with a lot of opposition from Parliament, the Health and Safety and Work Act. Now, the Health and Safety and Work Act basically is a very clever act. It's known as an enabling act. This means there's provision in the act to make regulations, right? So we can actually make other regulations up, right? And we don't have to repass it from Parliament. We cover parliamentary law in a statute law. But this is the type of the law we find in the Health and Safety and Work Act. So, hierarchy of statute law, right? We, we've also got some of the things in the act is a must or shall, right? So the must or shall is a legal provision within the act of what we have to do. A must or shall is very seldomly found. But because they are in the act, we have to abide by it for whatever we do. Does that make sense to you or not? Oh, talk to me, please talk to me. Yes, it does, yes. Right. It's, uh, it's like an order, like, kind of. Exactly, 100%. It's what we have to do. So if we say if we say we must or shall do something, we have to do it 100%. Right? So that's, that's what we do, and that's how we abide by the law. Yeah? yeah. Right? So they, they, there's not many of them in there. So I just want to get back to notes on it, so I'll just keep up with that and just make sure I'm on the right page. So, so a must duty, must duty, that is what you call as an absolute duty. My right? absolute duty is the highest level. So when we, it's like saying that you must wear this when you go on site, right? You shall do this, whatever you do. Right? And there's not many of them in there. And generally, they're qualified. And what they're qualified with is the lower ones, which are lower, lower ones. Which are, it's practical. If something is technically feasible, it should be done. Right? And reasonably practical is risk versus time, cost, and effort. I'm just going to need the changes. That's what I'm saying, because it goes some nice Right? So... 
So when you've got a must shall do, right, it's something you have to do. You don't find many, very many of them, but we will we will cover it. Like the same look. If you look at the section two, this is where we said it earlier about an unlimited bond. It shall, right? That's you must, right? Shall is a must, right? Be the duty of every employee to ensure so far as reasonably practically, so you've now qualified it, so far as reasonably practical, right? The health, safety, and welfare of all its employees. So they're basically saying to you in that is. You've got to make sure the health, safety, and welfare of everyone who works for you or everyone who comes to your place of work should come in in one state and go on in exactly the same state as they arrive to work. Right? This is why they qualify it. Now, section two is the one you're going to get prosecuted under. Right? So, without prejudice, the general duty of every employer under the preceding subsection of matters related to duty extends to include. Provision and maintenance of plant systems so far as reasonably practical, safe and without risk to health. Right? It's clearly written. Right? So that's plan. Right? B. Safe use and handling and storage and transport of the substances. That's COSH. It's not you. It's not you, James. I'm you. It's someone, it's someone else. I'm just going to try and find who it is. Whoever's talking, you know. I've handled storage and transport of the substances, which is COSH. C, instruction, training, supervision. All right? This is a legal requirement. You can't put people into work unless you train them, unless you give them instruction, unless you supervise them. It's a legal requirement. And lots of people are being prosecuted on this because people are getting sufficient training. They're asked to operate machinery or plant. And they haven't been given the training they needed to. Who's at fault with that? If somebody offers you, to, it asks you to go and operate a machine, right? Who's at fault? If the if someone gets injured, my fault because I'm not trained and qualified. Right? One, you haven't got the skills, knowledge, or training. Two, they shouldn't have sent you there in the first place, should they? So you're both being prosecuted for that. One, you being prosecuted because you've done it. Two, the manager will be prosecuted. You know, can't delegate health and safety, right? Now, I'll, I'll show you another little sh a slide later on about um, it's it's in your books, but if you look on it, it's it's a lovely little slide and it is about an excavation. And when you look at it, it says to you the contractor was fined uh, ten thousand eight thousand pound costs, so he got eighteen grand fine, and the site supervisor was fined eight hundred and a thousand, so he got an eighteen. For this trench that was just a trench that was unsupported and it was 1.8 meters deep similar to what you said earlier lodge about lowering a minute on the bucket it, was an, it was an unsupported trench so I'll, I'll show you it because you'll look at it and think Fuck it, i'll see that all the time you know what i mean and um, if you look at it, the hsc inspector just walked in and he went no and he fined the supervisor 1800 quid and he fined the management 18 18 thousand right and he and you look at it and you think unbelievable Absolutely unbelievable. I think that's my door. I don't know. Hang on. So, I don't know if that was my door. Anyway. Right. So, and then the next one under there, safe absence of risk of house, handy storage of travel. So, that's Kosh. The one underneath that is um, in, information, instruction, training, supervision. And the last one is access and egress. About access and egress, this is what we were talking about about not earlier, about access and egress, getting into that trench. Because they didn't allow for decent ladder access, egress, right? They are, he, he is prosecutable under health and safety and law regulations. Employees duties continue, continue section 2-3. When you employ five or more employees, you must prepare a written health and safety policy, set down the organisational arrangements, put the policy in effect, revise and update as necessary. Bring the policy to everybody's attention, because it has to be done. 
So, but it doesn't just end with the employer. We've got employees' duties as well, yeah. right? Why have we got employees' duties? Why do you think we have employees' duties? Anyone? That we could uh, follow the Health and Safety Act. Is anyone in your office? Yeah, well, sorry, change your hand up. I can't. Yeah, sorry. I'm really now struggling to hear. And uh, there sounds, it sounds like there's some background noise. Right. When we employ five or more people, we have to prepare a written health and safety policy. If you, as site managers, you will see it or you will place it up in your offices where you're working. It should be on display. Why? Why is it on display? Anybody know? Because we have to bring it to other people's attention. We have to say, this is our policy, and this is how we work out, and this is what we do. These are our organisational arrangements, and these are the people who's in control of that. Okay? So this is why we do it. Quick. Section 3 is employers' duties to consult with employees. All right? So it's what we do. We have to do it. Every employer and self-employed person must conduct their ways and undertake the ways to ensure as far as reasonable practice that a person is not in their employment, who may be affected or not exposed to the risks of their health and safety. So that's what we're trying to say there is we don't expose members of the public or we don't endanger members of the public in any way. Section four is when we're looking at plant and substances. It's got you can't see these slides, just bring it back up. Yeah, I'm back now, but uh, it's still the same. I'll, I'll just try and be more... Background feed, I'll, I'll stop them, you know what I mean? Because whoever it is, I can just mute them, so. So section four, right, is those that control a non-domestic premises, right? This is one of the questions you had in the, in the slide earlier or in the test earlier about non-domestic premises, and we said... Who is responsible, right? How do we we have to coordinate with other people, right? And it's why we do it. It's because it's a legal requirement of us. Section six is design, manufacturers, importers of any article substance we use in our work. So when we import anything, we, we used to go under the CLIP regulations and we go under the global regulations now, because obviously we left the EU. But if we send anything abroad, if we bring in anything from abroad, we have to give posh information for it. Why? Because it could be potentially dangerous. I.e., somebody just sent a load of uranium in through Heathrow Airport. Do you know what I mean? So we see that in the papers over the weekend? Or right, during the week, somebody just sent in? Anyway. Yeah, so they were possibly going to make a dirty bomb with it. But, yeah, but when we import things into countries, we have to make other people aware of it. So, Section 7, employees due to take reasonable care of themselves and others who may be affected by their acts and omissions. So we put a legal duty on employees to cooperate with their employer to enable them to comply with their health and safety law. So when you got, um, I'm going to I'm going to use him again. I'm going to use the name now. Nodge. When you got Nodge lowering someone down into a trench in a bucket, he is not. He's in breach of Section Seven of the Health and Safety and Work Act. Right? Why? Because he's stopping his employer from complying from the law, and he's not taking reasonable care of himself or others that may be affected by the activists. So when you swing off a scaffold one-handed or whatever you're doing you know whenever you whenever you go up a ladder carrying two odds one on each shoulder whatever you're doing like that you are in breach of section seven in the health and safety of work at because you cannot do it you're not allowed to do it right the legally you're not allowed to do it but when we say health and safety of work at we look at it and we think of it as at work right it's not just at work it's a duty on every person. No person may misuse or interfere with anything provided in the interest of health and safety of work welfare. This is not just limited to employees. So when you look at that, that um, you, you know when you go to a lake or a boating lake or fishing lake, you see on the side 
a life buoy on the side, and quite often kids grab them and throw them in the river. Right? They just discard them. They are in breach of Section 8 of the Health and Safety Work Act, because that's provided in the interest of health and safety. They now broke the Health and Safety Work Act. Now, you think, oh, well, what, what does that mean? Well, what, what do you think that means? Because this leads us into the next bit. What do you think it means? Anyone? No? You're in breach of statute law. Does anybody know what that means? Fine or other prohibition. What can it's a fine or other punishable, or any other thing that could be punishable. I'm not sure what punishment would be, but punishable no, by law. Say that again, Sam, slowly, a little bit slow. Sorry, it's punishable by law, basically, so you'll get a fine or some other impeded measure. Yeah. You're breaking the law, Sam. You're breaking the law. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but when we talk about law, we talk about all kinds of law, right? And we cover it in a little bit in a minute, and it's, this is, it, when we talk about law, it gets really confusing. Why? This is why we... They made it confusing. If you look at anything legal, they write in this lovely big words. They write in a load of jargon that you can't understand. And they do it, so you have to pay them loads of money to understand it. Right? And this is what they do. Right? But, um, section 9, no cost to employees, so obviously you can't charge for it. Right? And the health and safety law has just changed with PPE, hasn't it? Does any, anybody know about that? It changed, obviously, well, you know, and site managers now have to supply PPE for the subbies as well, so you say. Right, and it's a big change, because obviously, you can imagine going up to the site manager and saying, my boots are no good, you've got to give me a set, set of new boots. Can I? Right? And you can imagine the response you'd get from the site manager. So when, when did it show then? Ah, uh, it changed last year, right? <laughs> Right. You might want to do some little investigation on it yourself. Yeah, because he's thinking, oh, I'll go and get a set of new boots on my name. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it did change last year. It did change last year, right? And that includes guys having to look after subbies. Right? So you might want to do a little bit of investigation. Anyway, right. Section 15, right? Powers of the government to make regulations throughout the Act, right? See, so. The Act is an Act, right, let's explain the Act. The Health and Safety and Work Act is an Act of Parliament, right? It's a massive, great big document. I don't, know, I don't even know how many pages it is. I think it's 100 and something odd pages, right? But the Act is very intense. And under that Act, if we had to do that, that Act can take um, four, five, six years to pass through Parliament. Right? So if every time you wanted to make another set of health and safety regulations, so you had to go through that, we'd never get anywhere in line. Right? So they've said under Section 15, we can make regulations on the Act. They've said under Section 16, we can make ACOPs on the Act. Under Section 20, we give powers to the inspectors to enforce the Act. Right? So we say this is where we can say, You've got the power, and you can enforce the act. Oh, just just out of interest, can everybody else hear me? Right? I can hear you fine. Yeah, that's right. No, that's just cool. obviously because of James, and he he would be struggling. That's why I say because it might be my mic, and I might need to turn my mic up. A bit. But uh, I was yeah. You know, I can hear you, but it's just not loud enough. So I don't know. Yeah. Can you turn it up as far as what's any more than you've turned it up? Yeah, it is up, it is up, and it's quite close to me, so yeah. But it's, that's, that's why I, I asked, you know, just to make sure that everybody else can hear me, okay? Like, what you're doing right now, you're close to it, I can hear you yeah. much, much better. Yeah, okay. Right, so, and then obviously, powers of inspection, section 20, and then section 36, it, oh, hang on, sorry, his offence has been committed due to the fault of another person, they may also be prosecuted. So where it's collaborative, right, so... And if another person has caused the fault, as in like the supervisor and the manager, we can both be prosecuted. And then 37 is corporate manslaughter. So this is when the boss is, somebody dies on your watch, right? 
And basically, it's not just the site manager carries the can because you guys probably all work for larger companies, right? And you've got directors, CEOs, and so on and so on. You cannot delegate health and safety. So your director, your CEO has to carry the can, right? You can't say, site manager, he should have done that. And I'll tell you a little story about it later. But, you, you, you know, you can't just delegate. It's down to him as well, right? So you can't just say, well, we put all the provision in place. Yeah, but did you supervise him? Did you instruct him? And did you train him? Did you monitor him, right? Did you review it? Yeah, you know, so you say, you can't just say we give him the information, he should have done that, because it doesn't work like that. Right? So you say, it's there, and it's there to protect us, but it's also there to beat us with as well. So, how acts are made? Just a quick one, and it, and it is really quick, because it's very long winded. Right? When you want to make an act of parliament, you say, oh, I've got this real good act, and I think, I think you should look at this and you go around and you talk to all the other MPs and you sound them out and you say, look, this is what I want to do. And this, let's say you want to say, um, right, um, no one can fly model airplanes on, on a Sunday. Right? right? And this is your act. Let's I'll just pick something really random and really strange. Right? And, he's, and he, you discuss it with all the other MPs, right? Just, to, you know, just like over a cup of tea or a biscuit or whatever. Yeah. And they say, yeah, that's a good act. So that's a preliminary act. Right? Then it becomes, you want to make it a little bit more formal, and it becomes a green paper. So then you're just trying to seek opinion. And they say, oh, no, I think you should put this in there. You, I think you should put that in there. So then when you get it to that sort of stage, this is going to take you a year, right? You then get it to a white paper, right? And then it's basically, it's laid out, they look at it, they read it in Parliament. If they think it's any, any good, they progress it on. So it goes through its first reading. You can object to it, it goes straight back to the beginning then. Or you can say, oh, I think that, and, yeah, and I think you should add to this or add to that. And then it goes to a second reading, third reading. And then once it gets to that stage, it goes to a committee stage. After that, it then goes to a report stage. After that, it then goes to the third reading. After that, it goes to the House of Lords, and they read it, and it goes through all them stages again with the House of Lords. Then it gets laid out for 30 days in both houses, and if they both look at it and go, yeah, I think that's really good. Right? Then it gets the royal assent and the king, I would have said queen, because we're so used to saying queen. Right? The king then gives it royal assent and it's passed. And it's then made law. Right? So that's how long-winded it is. It can take four or five years to do. Right? And the reason why they do it like that is to give you a chance to object to it or to add to it or amend to it. So when we look at law, Acts of Parliament are the top one. They're known as primary legislation. They're passed down by the Houses of Parliament. They're reviewed by the Houses of Lords. Uh, Health and Safety and Work Act lays down general duties to be followed but make provision for the regulations and ACOPs to be made on the meeting. Regulations, these are known as de delegated leg legislation and made under the Health and Safety and Work Act for the Secretary of State or by the Secretary of State. They're generally made in conjunction with other parties. So if you like, another party like might be the, the lead association might have an input on the lead regulation. So I pick them or the asbestos association might have an input on the asbestos regulation. So um, typical regulations, you took the management, the health and safety and work regulations, 1999, which is the only regulation under Regulation 3 you will find that you have to conduct a risk assessment, right? Provision of use of work equipment, PUA 1998, or the Workplace Health and Safety Regulations, not one two. Under the regulations, we have ACOPS, right? We have ACOPS. ACOPS are approved code of practice. They're produced by the Health and Safety Center with the consent of the Secretary of State. They give a recognised interpretation of the law and how to comply with it. Right? One ACOP is written for each specific regulation and gives guidance on how and best to comply with requirements. ACOPs are not legally binding, but they can be used in a court of law if you don't comply with them. So they can be used to beat you with, if you like. You can say, 
I didn't combine with any ACOPs I'd done. Everything I'd done was over and above what was required. Or you can, they can say he didn't comply with the ACOPs, although he doesn't have to legally. It is a set standard. It's approved code of practice. When you say approved, it means that's how we do things. Like you always stir the cup, the tea left hand anti-clockwise when you make tea. You know, it's how it should be done. I, I don't make tea, so I don't know. But I'm just trying to give you some sort of definition of what an ACOPS is. It's basically, it's a, it's a laid down, unwritten law, if you like, that says how we do it. So when we, what kind of ACOPS you um, Safety in the installation and use of gas appliances. There's, um, there's, there's loads of them, absolutely loads and loads of them. Right? But, you know, there's uh, 53 different ACOPs on it, guys. So, but there is a fair few of them. Right. Guidance notes. Now, these are the lowest on the last one. They're official guidance. They're provided by the HSC to give a greater understanding of solution and best practice advice regarding certain regulations or requiring certain guidance. So like HSG6, which is safe working and lifting trail trucks, uh, trail lift trucks. Um, HSG17, safe use of abrasive wheels, or HSG38, which is light in the world. Yeah, it's, there's absolutely loads of them, but they're there as extra. Does anybody know where you can get any of this information? Through a website. Yeah, through their website, right? And it's a mind field of information, but there is loads of good information. Sometimes it does. It is a bit laborious to navigate, but there is a lot of information there, and it's a real big help. Right? Types of law. When we look at law, when we mentioned law earlier, we mentioned statute law. So statute law is written down by Parliament. It's passed by Parliament, it's Acts and Regulations. It's a criminal offence, so it's a criminal offence, right, to break it. So it's punishable with fines and imprisonment. In the lower court, in the lower court, magistrates is 12 months, in the upper court is two years, right? So it is a criminal offence to break statute law. Then got civil law and common law. Now, civil law is when someone comes to work for you, um, trips over, breaks his leg, he will then prosecute you under civil law. That's the easiest way of looking at civil law. And that's about redress, getting some compensation, putting him back to how he was before your injury. Right? But when they look at law, it's a burden of proof there, right? It's a balance of probability, probabilities, excuse me, so, but probabilities in the mouse So it's a balance. So they're, what they're saying by that is if it was possible that it could have happened, it most probably did, right? Don't worry about, I know you can tire in with law, but I'm going to go for lunch in a minute. Law is all day. This is the worst day. It's the worst day for me. It's the worst day for you. Right? I'll tell you if you need to make notes of it. That one there is probably worth a screenshot or a photograph of, you know what I mean? But it's not necessary. We won't be questioned on it, but it's certainly worth it. I'd expect you guys to be looking at your XA6 as we go through and trying to get some of the answers, because I've already covered two or three questions in the XA6 at the moment. That should be keeping you awake. All right, so civil law is about redress. It's about getting you back to where the position you was before. When you see someone been sacked or someone's been injured, they go for compensation. You've got a three-year time limit on it. You can't insure against claims because you, you can insure against claims, sorry, I should say. You can't insure against claims in criminal law. It is illegal. You cannot insure against criminal law, right? But you can insure against civil law, right? Common law is the body of case law. It's what's passed down over time. It's passed by judicial precedents. It applies to both criminal and civil law. Right? That's the 
the easiest way. So it's age-old laws that have been around since the year dot. That's what you would call common law. That's what is seen and done as a common practice. Does everyone understand the full states of the law there? Anyone, yes. anyone struggling on it at all? No, no. Law is very complicated. It is complicated, but it's, if you need me to address any of it again, I will go. I will just skate back over it. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. If we go back to the civil law, B. Yeah. Um, the three-year time limit is yeah. that on the person actually taking like a civil get, action against? Like, yeah, you get injured. You got a three-year time limit, right? You get if you get sacked, right? Right. If you get sacked, which you consider to be um, unjust, right? You get injured, and you consider it to be, and you get. Let's say, say you, say you was um, um, uh, I can't even think of one of their names. Um, just the um, cyclist uh, delivery guy, and you got run over and you broke your leg, so you couldn't work, so you've been sacked, right? right. So immediately, you'll be taking your boss to court because he should have done something to you, not necessarily self-employed, self-employed or not. You can take a, a civil case against him for loss of earnings because you can no longer work. You can't work for, I don't know, what's it, what, breaking legs, six weeks in it? Six weeks, probably. Six weeks you're in a cast, maybe, maybe say another six weeks in rehabilitation. So, say, say 12 weeks you couldn't work. Right. You'd be looking at trying to get that compensation from them and trying to get your job back at the end of that 12 weeks. And that's what you'll be trying to get. And the judge will say to him, well, you go to the judge and you say, well, I, I wasn't employed, or he wasn't employed. This is what the employer would say. He wasn't employed. He was a subby. He'd say, yeah, but he's an employee in all, all sense of the word. Because in health and safety, well, there's no discrimination between a subby or an employee. So effectively, is he was working for you. He was doing deliveries for you. You didn't risk assess it to say we need to protect him in a better environment instead of on that busy London road in a fish bike. You got him run over effectively. You now need to give him some compensation and his job back. And you get a three year time. Yeah, but Frank, if you ain't reported it, can you still make a claim though? You what, sorry? If you haven't made a, you just say you had an accident at work and you didn't report it, you carried on working, can you still make a claim on it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always best, right, the reporting of it, what you're trying to say there is if you didn't pull in an accident, mm. right? Um, if you didn't pull in an accident report, it's very silly, right? Because you should pull in an accident report no matter whatever happens. But would you, if you've got witness testimony or if, you can, if you've got, um, if you seek medical help for it after that event, so let's say you injured your back, because you're going to be ground workers, so you went to your back um, in ground works. On Tuesday, it was all right Wednesday, but uh, Thursday, I said you couldn't do it, you couldn't do it, and you then took several weeks off uh, for, and you had several weeks for a loss of earnings, and you had uh, prescriptions and things like that, and you had several uh, rehabilitation, or you had a chiropractor, and things like that. All then costs and then add up, and that's what you would be going for, civil compensation in the courts for against them. And, right, so. and in relation to the burden of proof, uh, B? The burden of proof is the burden, yes. right? So if it could have happened, it probably did. Because my question relating to that is, say, for example, it's on Monday. Yep. So someone actually got injured on Sunday off work. Manage to get into work, say they yeah. twisted their ankle yeah. somewhere out off site, yeah. but then didn't say nothing, started working, and after an hour he goes, Oh, I've yeah. twisted my ankle, but it happened off. Yeah, it well, actually it's true. If you test him, if you bring the medical people, they'll say, Yes, definitely, he's got a twisted ankle. Yeah, yeah, right. So, what you're trying to say there is, is um, you, that's totally different, you know what I mean? What you're trying to say, the balance of proof is. If there's if you can if you go gone out there and say look I twisted my ankle and look at the state of the site and I'll take the photograph of it 
right, and shown all rubbish scattered all over the place, right? And if you and if you've got some other witness testing statement saying, no, we're working in this, um, we're trying to attack ceilings, they've got staircases stored in the house, there's crap all over the floor from the chippies, and I'm trying to attack ceilings and, and it's it's an untidy site, it's a, and I've twisted my ankle on it. Boom. Right, I've seen people, right, I've seen attacker, right, not seen personally, I've, I know of a case, attacker loaded some concrete blocks on the up to a doorway to reduce the step up into the house as he's carrying in the boards. He's tripped, he's hurt himself, he's injured himself, and he's had a week off work. And he's taken them to court, even though he placed the blocks He's the there. one <laughs> yeah. He placed the blocks there, he's taken them to court for not providing good access and egress. You cannot diminish, we cannot can't push it onto someone else. Do you know how that ended up? Then? Huh? How did it end up? He, he would have won it. They would have just sat without a court. They wouldn't have let it go to court because as soon as he got to court, the barrister charges two hundred fifty pound an hour. So he actually had a case, even though he's the one that put the. Because they just settle it. They just say, "Oh, just how, how long did he have off? Seven days. Give him a grant. Send him on his way." Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, and at the end of the day, is they just pay you out generally. But, you know, that's, that's sort of what happens. Because what, what the judge will look at, when we get to the burden of the principle, if you look at the other one, if you look at criminal law, it says beyond all reasonable doubt. So then when you when you look at beyond all reasonable doubt, is you are innocent until proven guilty. It will be under generally a trial of your peers, which is a jury. And the jury will say, it looks like it did happen. There's certain facts that say it did happen. And that is beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So they would have to get to a consensus of like, I don't know, like a majority, so like nine out of 12 have, have said it's happened, right? So, so that would be the beyond all reasonable doubt. It's not beyond all reasonable doubt, but it's practically a majority that everyone's agreed. Generally, you get into everybody's agreement on it. You know, like he did do it 100%, right? But there has been miscarriages of justice in right? so that's criminal. Balance of probability is saying, right, it's a dirty site, he likely fell over. Right? The company doesn't care about health and safety, he's going to get injured. That's the balance of probability. It's like there's a lot of traffic on the road, he's going to get run over. You know what I mean? It's, you know, the chances are. It's like, it's a scale, so they're saying it could have happened, so it probably did happen, right? So that's the difference between the two laws, right? Yeah. I'll just mention now, while we're talking about law, because I just said mention it, is I said to you beyond all reasonable doubt. On that statement, I said to you, you are innocent, proven guilty. Does everybody know that in this country? Yes. With the exception health and safety law, you are guilty until proven innocent. Really? Right, it's the only time the law works the other way round, and you are guilty until proven innocent, and you're not allowed to prove yourself innocent. Oh, really? Oh. Right, so, That's scary. Uh, it is very, very scary. Right, see, so, and it is in I'm most guilty. countries... Right, you have got the burden of you've got the burden of proof. Or you're, basically, the burden of proof is on you to prove yourself innocent, although you're not allowed to go go to the scene. You're not allowed to. So if you let's say you, I can, I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you the story, right, and I'll just get it out of the way. I've probably heard this one before, but but a friend of mine, well, he's not a friend of mine, he's a colleague, I should say, he's not a friend. He worked for a company in Southampton. Uh, they were building 200 flats on the St. Union. Uh, he was working for Linden Homes, which is quite a biggish sort of organisation. Um, he had 200 flats. Uh, the guy there, as the site manager, he would have to lock them up every night. So if you've done any site manager duties, you would know you go around, you, you open the door, you say, anybody in here? You go, no, shut the door, lock it up. Right? Anyone in there? No, lock it up. 
And it takes you to do 200 flats, it's going to take you, I don't know, two or three hours. So when do you, well, if you're going to open them every morning, that's going to take you two or three hours. And if you're going to lock them every morning, every night, it's going to take you two or three hours. So you spend most of your time as the gatekeeper, you know, the door opener, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, you try and delegate in, you try and do it. So what you do is you end up going to the door, shouting anyone in there, no, shut the door, right? Lock it up, right? That's that's what happens. Well, on this particular day, he he gone to this particular flat. I call it number forty-four. All right, gone to forty-four. Anyone in there? No. Shut the door. Lock it up. Go. All right. About seven o'clock at night, he gets the phone call. All right. Yeah. It was such and such on a certain day. He says, "Yeah." He said, "What are you in for?" Oh, you know, we all that. We're in the house seven o'clock at night. He's saying, "Yeah, well, he ain't come home." So. Do me. Yeah, but he always comes home. And his missus is bone to me. He always comes home. He didn't come home. You know, what are you ring me for? Yeah, you know, I don't understand why you're ringing me, right? And he's like, because he always comes home. They were going out, right? And he ain't made that home. And she's worried. He said, well, give it, give it another hour or so. If she don't come home, if you don't come home, Try and ring around a few of mates, see if he's popped in there. If you don't come home, then I'll go down the site again. All right, give it another round, nine o'clock, he ain't come home. To so go down the site, unlock the site, gets his torch out, monitors across the site, turns all the power back on. All right, goes up flat 44, because that's where he's working, and exactly where he's working, gets the key, unlocks it. He's laying on there, he's had a stroke. All right, he's had a stroke. All right. Paramedics, down and come, ambulance follows, in the stretcher, takes a fucking hell, you can imagine what that. Lights out, locks the door, back home, goes back home, hits his bottle of wine, goes to bed, does what he normally does, you know. Seven o'clock next morning, he gets to site, he got plod weight. Handcuffs go on, anything you say will be taken down and used in evidence against you. Right, called official caution comes across. Right, so he's now been arrested. Matey, two o'clock in the morning, dies in the hospital. Now you'd think, right, he died off site. He died off site, so really technically ain't nothing to do. It's the hospital, we should be reporting that. Right, but anyway, the injury happened on site. Although it's a natural injury, his body packed up in some way. So matey, then his company went, oh, fuck, you know, I can't believe they've arrested him. We'll do the decent thing and send him to Lizard. Not, oh, let's ring his wife and make sure everything's right. Oh, so what, who's going to cover the song? What are we going to do? <laughs> right? You know, that's what they're looking at. So these are people who he's known for years, friends, people he goes around their houses with, people he golfs with. Right? People he goes to dinners with. These are the friends that you know, you have a laugh and joke with and so on. Yeah? Every single day. Right? You ring them up and you talk to the project managers and they've dropped him like a sack of shit. And when he should have checked the property and made sure it's in his site rules, it's in the company procedures. He has to check the properties and make sure they're empty. It's his fault. And they dropped him. He got suspended. For six months, he sat at home with no money. For six months, he was alienated and ostracized. For six months, his so-called colleagues and friends didn't want nothing to do with him. Story. As I stand here now, right? True story. The guy died. He had a stroke, right? It's only because he was due home and he always comes home that his missus bothered to ring in. He had a chance of survival when they took him in and put him in hospital, but he didn't make it. Very sad, but it wasn't the site manager's fault. It was because he didn't check and make sure he'd left site. Now, we all know when we sign in or fingerprint in or retina scan in, whatever way we get into site, that that number should, we have 12 in, we get 12 out. We get 200 in, we get 200 out. 
how many times on your sites people come in and not sign out? How many times do they come onto your site, go to the shop, and don't bother signing out, and then come back in again? How many times do they walk out, not through the turnstile, but through the main traffic gate? It happens all the time. Right? Mate, he didn't, mate, mate, as far as mate you concerned, he'd, he'd gone out. What mate he didn't do was check that he'd actually signed off site. Because he could have looked, because why? Because he knows he, if he checked every single day, he'd be there every single day looking for people who left site and not signed out. That's the problem. Because it happens all the time. You've done it yourself. I've done it myself. We've all done it. Let's not say I'm an angel, because we've all done it. There's no halo above my head. Well, we've all done it. Right? But the point being is, he couldn't ascertain whether he was on site or not. He's left site and mate took for six months with no wages, time off work, and then he got acquitted on the charges. Suddenly, it's like, oh, he's come back to work now. I don't really want to work for you anymore. Being the way you treat me, I don't want to work for you. My marriage is done shit up. My house is being repossessed. Right, got no job, cars got back, I've had no transport, and you want me to come back and work here? Where was you to support me for the six months? What did you do for me? Didn't even arrange for a solicitor. Would you go back to work for him? Most, most probably not. No, most probably not. Right? Why? Because they treated him really, really badly. You know what I mean? They treated him really, really badly. And I, you know, and I don't blame him. I don't blame him 100%. Right? But, you know, at the end of the day, that's a little story. It's a true story. It's, you know, um, it, it, it can be traced. It can be, it can be tracked all the way. Yeah, so, and it's not good. But the first thing they do is arrest him straight away. And that's the same way if you break environmental. The first time, if you cut down trees on site, if you've ever come across that, and you cut down anything with a TPI, the first thing you do is arrest you. Read you, the, read you the caution, the police caution, the official caution. Right. We'll go to lunch now. Right. We'll have a half hour lunch. As I say, if it's about redress, like whether it's, uh, it's an employment tribunal, whether it's um, a compensation, a civil compensation, you go to this side to the Kenwood Courts. You then can go across the, the Crown Court, right? But and then it would go to the Court of Appeal or High Court, Court of Appeal, and Supreme Court. If it's a criminal prosecution, breaking statute law, breaking health and safety law, it can be heard in the Magistrates Court. If it's too serious, if it's too serious, then we'll up it into the Crown Court. When they're up it into the Crown Court, that means they can't give you, because there used to be a restriction on, in a magistrate's court, they could only give you a six months prison term, and they bumped it to a year. And magistrate's court, basically, you know, they were limited on when you can do a criminal prosecution. I think it's five years, I believe. It's the maximum they can give, but it's generally it's kicked up to the High Court, the Crown Court, like the Higher Court, and they can issue the sentence. But they've both got the same sort of powers. If you've got an environmental issue, they can imprison you up for five years with, so it goes straight to Crown, because Crown can give out long sentences and things like that. So that's how it works. So when we look at enforcement of health and safety law, we're looking at certain bodies that can do it and if you go back to what i said to you about the powers of inspectors there's certain inspectors now everybody knows or if you can remember it the hsc the hsc is the main one that we deal with all right so when we look at the hsc that's what everybody considers who's going to be who we're going to get has anybody ever had a prohibition or enforcement notice against them sit that's that again i didn't catch that has anybody had a prohibition or an improvement notice against them? No. No. No? Yeah, court fines and parking fines and enforcement. I do my enforcement. No, no, no. 
this is health and safety law. Uh, yeah. Not parking fines. <laughs> <laughs> But no, has anybody ever had an improvement notice or a prohibition notice against them? No, we'll cover the notices and different types of notices in a minute. But it's you know just asking if, if you know the company they work for or where they've worked if they've ever had an enforcement notice against them in any way. Right. So when we look at construction, and this is what you're on, you're on a construction course. We're generally concerned with the HSE. So. And the HSC cover construction, mines, spare grounds, agriculture, broadcasting, railways, some of the railways, not all of it. We get a lot of railway guys on our, on our courses. And some of the fire they cover as well. But <clears throat> when we work in anywhere like retail, offices, catering, uh, car parks, churches, like. Um, I said he had to do skylights in church. He would have come under the local authority because it's a church place of worship. But because it's construction, the chances are they would say, how can safety executive deal with this more than I do? Right? They deal with this more than I do. Let them deal with it. Right? So you say, again, are you working through your XA6 books? Yeah, anyone speaking? Anyone? Can I? No. No. Why not? We will have to you. Why not? That's what I'm trying to get across here. Why is it so dumb? Because uh, I'm following what you've got on the screen. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm putting on the screen is answers to your XA6. That's what I'm trying to get across here. That's what I'm, I, I'm trying to... This is why I'm saying to you. If you follow what I'm saying on the screen, and I understand that, but... When you're looking at the XA6 book, you've got one, you could, was it 18 questions in section A? Let me just have a look at that. You've got eight, eight, possibly 18 questions? Is it 18? Section A? Uh, 23. 23, okay. So it's worth just having open, and if I actually give you an answer, Fill it in because it's going to save you time. Yeah, it's going to save you time by a long shot, isn't it? Yeah. Has anybody looked at the XA6 book at all? Been uh, trying to match up as, as we've been going along. I've got at least two or three. Yeah, good. Because it, it's it's a way of you just shortening your workload. And I'm, all I'm trying to do is just literally help you, you know what I mean? Because you've got to complete this. If you don't complete this, you don't pass the course. It's simple as that. I can't be any blame with that. So, you know what I mean? So, on, on, on 23 onwards is section A, right? And as you're looking at it, or as I'm talking about it, right? I've covered C, I've covered B on, on question one, I've covered... A, I've covered E, I've covered F, I've covered G. That's all the one answer straight away. Right? Two, I've covered, and I will cover again in a minute. Right? Three, I've just covered. A, B, C, and D. Right? And five, I've just covered, because I just told you. Right? So you say, I'm nearly halfway through the book already. I'm, I'm a third of the way through or a quarter of the way through. And all I'm trying to do is help you to shorten. See, you, instead of listening to me and, and, and looking at what I've got to tell you, <laughs> right, is basically you will then get more time to yourself, more time to go drinking, more time to go watch football, more time to go take my word about, go to the pictures, and everything. So I'm just trying to Make sure this is the answers to the to the exam in here as well. I'm going to give you ten in a minute. All right, I'll tell you that in a minute. So you don't have to look it up. I'm not asking you to research and look it up. What you're doing is actively learning. When you're actively learning, it means you're researching as well. Oz is doing it all the time. If you notice you watch him, he's dropping it in all the time. He drops in little links and things like that. And he got two twins. He got twins in there. See that. I listen to everything that people say to me. I don't listen to it. Do you hear anyone else know? 
Right, so anyway, local authority. So when you're working in a church, like Oz was saying earlier, when he was doing these skylights, he would have come under the local authority. But the chances are, they would have said to him, because it's construction, construction mainly covers HSE work, when let the HSE take over, but they would have been under the local authority regulations. Right? The local authority is your council. Like, that's the easiest way of looking at it. That's the local authority. Perhaps your county council, Sussex County Council, Hawks County Council. <coughs> that's who, who, you, who your authority is. Then the other authorities don't that. <coughs> it's your thorough authority, your environmental agency. Everybody knows who they are. And then in Scotland, it's the seat. As I said, yeah, in ca cases of health and safety law, you're guilty to proven as well. So, powers of inspectors, right? The main object of the inspector, everybody thinks they're there to prosecute, right? Everyone thinks they're there to prosecute. They're not. They're there to stimulate compliance with health and safety legislation and to ensure that a good standard of protection is maintained. It's up there. It's literally straight up there. Stimulate compliance with health and safety legislation to ensure that good standard of protection is maintained. That's what they're there to do. They're there to advise and guide. The first thing they would do is give you verbal or written advice. Right? So, if an inspector calls and he says to you, or how long you doing that, he would give you some advice. Basically, he wouldn't say, I want you to do it this way. He'd say, I need you to look at. Let's say you were working at Iron Scan. It's say, oh, we need you to look at the work on regulations because what you're doing there isn't really compliant. Right? So that's what he would be looking at. Right? So he's looking at trying to give you some advice and have the best practice, the way to go forward. That's his first task. But a couple of people were missing on the camera today, so they may be back. So can you just pop, pop back in, please? It's Yes, sorry, I have some internet issues. I'm trying to sort them out. Yeah. I, 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 it's not only you, Ed. I've got Val missing. I've got Frank missing. So it's just, you know, I just want to make sure you're all ready. You could be done the bar. God forbid. Hey. <laughs> Bye, so. Verbal written advice, information advice, that's the first thing they give you. And then if they if you don't comply with the advice that they're gonna give you, they're gonna give you approvement or prohibition notices. Now approvement notice is something you would consider let's say he rolls on the site and he was say say he came in the site and he see you had no F ten in place. Do you know what an F ten is? No. An F10 is the notice you would issue to say that you have actually started the construction site. So we'll cover it later on. So let's, I don't want to do it yet because you're going to transgress from what we're doing. But let's say he he turned up on site and you've got no statement of evidence, no, no help and safety policy on You say you've got no policy on it. How can you display it to all your contractors that you've got nothing on And you go, I'm most sorry, I think I'm pretty so then say he comes in two weeks later or you've got no public liability because you can, you can associate that with a lot of that. So let's say you've got no public liability on display. As you all know, you've got insurance, right? And if you've got no insurance on display, right, he would say, not happy, why haven't you got the insurance on display? Right? I'm going to give you an improvement that means you've got to improve, you've got to make it better. So that's a minor offence, yeah? It's a minor offence, right? If you had a prohibition notice issue, what's that like? You need to stop the building site until it's improved. Yeah, but what's it for? Why would you issue a prohibition notice? Uh, for uh, unsafe areas to work, for unsafe site. Well, there's a risk of serious personal injury. Thank you. Somebody read the slide. 
<laughs> right? Because there's a serious risk of personal injury, risk of serious personal injury. Right? Right? It's on the slide there, look. A prohibition notice is issued if there is, or is likely to be, a risk of serious personal injury. So when you've got a really unsafe scaffold, you would issue a prohibition notice until it was in print. Yeah? When you've got a piece of paper missing, he would just issue an improvement notice. Right? Because it, that's all he's concerned with. He wants you to do some improvement. Right? When it's a serious risk of harm, damage to property or people, right? It does include property or people. He would issue a, a mission notice. So it could be a structural collapse. It could be a simple structural collapse. You know what I mean? But he would issue he would issue that notice for them sort of reasons, right? So you've got a right of appeal, obviously. With a prohibition notice, they get issued and they're immediately enforceable. With an improvement notice, you can it can be waived and you get 21 days to get it, get it at the time. So inspectors, obviously, they try and give you informal, wherever they can, they try and talk to you because they are reasonable people. So they try and give advice and guidance in minor offences, whatever. If they start writing you a letter or an email, it suddenly becomes a little bit more formal. When they're doing it formally, it contains details and actions, right? It's about how you comply with legislation. I right, see, so improvement notices, again, as I say, is, is a small, minor breach. You might not have um, any cups on site, you know what I mean? might not have any cups on site in the welfare area, but it's a minor breach. And in primary notice, it's is a major breach, if you like, or there's a risk, serious risk of personal injury. Right. I've got Maybe. a question. Yeah, go on. So, in regards to a prohibition notice, yeah. uh, you've given the example, like, say, faulty scaffolding, which is dangerous, that might result in personal injuries to someone, Yeah. and therefore they have the inspector has then issued a, a, a prohibition of this. Yeah. And I see in your notes here that it has to go to a tribunal for it to be lifted. Is that the only way? Because I'm thinking that's quite lengthy and that could... It is actually... quite lengthy. It is quite lengthy. Uh-huh. It is quite lengthy. I so see. So it, it, right. it work stops then. Right, so if you get a prohibition like this, right, it's going to immediately stop work on that particular activity. So let's say you've got, I've had, not me personally, right, not me personally, but I've had to remedy it in, in another situation. Right? So, um, construction site for the company I was working for, they was building a block of, I don't know, 20 odd flats, not very, not very big, it was a long, narrow, skinny block, right on the main road. And behind it, they were building um, another 20 houses or so. And the actual block got served with a prohibition notice by, by the inspector. He came and turned up. He, he, he said, can I just... Oh, it's five seconds. Oh, I'll forget. But um, the, the inspector served the notice on the property, and he said, you can't do that. And I said, I've got to wait for the delivery of my computer to be returned. Just no one sounds from the door. Yeah, it's some reason. Two seconds, let me just check. Right, so yeah. This particular instance they served a prohibition notice on the on the block of plats. I've gone there and they said, oh, we've got a major uproar. You know, there's somebody served the prohibition notice in the block of flats. We, we've got to sort it out. And I've gone down there as a senior site manager to try and sort it back to find get moving again. Um, I immediately stopped the work on the block of flats because obviously that was the important thing. So the work must stop. Um, I then pushed all the workload and all the workforce onto the neighbouring houses. They said, you can't do that, it's right in the vicinity, you need to be cleared up. I said, look, hang on then. The area that you put a prohibition notice on was the block of flats. I then carried on work with the rest of the job, 
and pushed them forward, whereas the other block of flats got remedied. Then we went into discussions with our HSC, said, right, you know, because it's a phone call, generally it's a phone call, and we say, right, you've given us a prohibition notice, I'm not happy, how do we get over this, how do we get out of it? And they go, well, this particular reason is we were pumping nine-inch blocks up, up to um, four storeys in the air, 17 metres in the air, or whatever it was, and he wasn't very happy about it. They were being cut in half because they were nine-inch block. Uh, they weren't being cut in half. He wanted them cut in half because they were too heavy for the guys to lower. And he said, I want all them blocks put down. And he was quite draconian about it. He said, I want more put down. I said, not a chance now, mate. And he said, what do you mean? I'm the HSC and I, I'll tell you that this is a not a chance now. Not happening. Never in a million years am I bring them back down. And he went, why? I've told you to do it. And I said, if I bring them back down, you're endangering people's life. I said, because to get a forklift to lift something off a scaffold 17 metres in the air is really dangerous. It's different when you're, you're putting something down on the scaffold, but to take something off a loaded bay and bring it back down on a poorly stacked pallet, not a chance now. I said, there's no way I'm out of doing that. And he agreed. And effectively, we laid the remaining blocks up there. Then we took the blocks all up there and cut them in half. And it was all over this inspector. And he was flexing his muscles and saying, I know better than you. I said, well, you might know better than me, but you're not going to get away with that because you can't just dictate to people. It's about discussions and so on. Well, so was the prohibition then lifted after this? It was, after, it was later, it, after we After we moved it, we... we, we we put in a new system of work. We then applied for it to be lifted, and it gets lifted, and it, it doesn't have to go to the tribunal. The tribunal, you're probably misreading that wrong. Right. Right? It's the tribunal is for you to appeal against it. So right. HSC HS, listen to you, both sides, what you're saying, what the inspector is saying, right. the, the and decided. The prohibition notice stops. The right. prohibition that it stops, it stops right. the work, you have to comply with that, it's legally, you have to comply with it. Right. Uh, right, but then you can say, right, we've rectified it, right, we've rectified it. So when we say you stop work, you, if, you, you can't stop work, and you, you, you see what I'm trying to say is you can't, when they say to you, right, that scaffold's dangerous, you have to stop work. Right. Right, you stop work, but you've got to work on that scaffold to put it right in there. That's the only work that you can perform on that. There you go, right? So you say you have to work on the scaffold to put it right, and once they put it right, you can then call the inspector and say, right, we've rectified it. He said, right, I'm going to arrange for a visit to come down. And he'd come down, he'll examine it, inspect it, he said, I'm happy with all the more drainages, whichever the case may be. And then the notice can be lifted. Right? But the trouble with that notice is it's recorded against you on the HSC website. If you fail to agree their terms, they will prosecute. That's the next one. Right? The next the next slide, I should say, prosecute. Right? So the last one there is the prosecution. Right? So you say, that's when it gets to you, where that last stage where there's no he's not happy, he's then going to prosecute and he's then going to look at recovery costs. Now it could go straight to prosecution, depends on the inspector, right? It depends on the company you're working with, it depends on the reputation you've got with the HSC. Most of them, most of them you can work with. Sometimes you're going to get the balance. You know what I mean? Of course you are. You're a hundred percent. Right, so, but, yeah, that's how it works. I can't, you know, prosecution cases, oh, I don't know, I think I'll come up to, come up to it on the piece of intervention, possibly on the next slide, but, it's, um, but you know, they make millions of pounds every single year. Just to double check, when it's a prosecution, yeah. is that to, for an individual that is responsible or the company? Ah, right. Again, right, so, let me just... I mentioned this slide to you earlier. I just want to bring it up. I'd say, because you, 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 keep, you keep pushing on that little one, you know what I mean? And, it's, um, and, and I want you to, Sorry because it, no, no, no. 
I want you to because the, the, the simple reason is you. I, I want to show it to you, and that's the easiest way around it. And then you'll see it, and you'll go, unbelievable. Right, so you say, it's in the explains it and it really shows it for me. No, it's for an exclamation. I I dispute this a little bit because he's saying it's one point nine meters deep, so it's just two meters is six meters. Right? And you've got certain guys you are symbols anyway. They don't put all the things two meters deep. One, right? You can see by alongside that pipe, that's a 600 long um, Harris Rag, Harris fence, fence, fence base. Well, and it looks like it's halfway up or at least a third of the way up. All right, so he's fined them £10,000 with a contractor, £8,000 cost, and he fined the supervisor £1,000 and eight hundred pound cost. Right, so it's not just the contractor, you can find the supervisor as well. You see that right or not? Remember you look you're struggling to read it there. Is no, it? contractor ten thousand and HSC yeah. was awarded eight thousand. Yeah. But you can see you know, you can clearly see what the problem is there. It's an unsupported trench, and I'm now going to pick on the ground workers, right? I'm going to, I'm going to pick on, uh, it's Lodge, is that a, a typical excavation? And if they, if they excavate like that, what they need to do, they need to have a batter the sides, or do steps, or put a trench box. No, you can not answer my question. Go on, mate. Is it a typical excavation? It's not a typical excavation, 100% not, no. Now you would say it's no, but, but you see that all the time. That's the utility still, right? But it, it, that's, yeah, that's done all the time. It's, it's really, all it's the time. All, all the, the time. time. It's, it's like that. No one, no one's got time to waste on sites. You know it is. Right, and you know, you know yourself, there's, they wouldn't get a trench box in there. Right, you know yourself. Right, because what, I don't know what that is that's running through it. That's a typical excavation, what you see on, on site all the time. That's the unfortunate section about it. You can see how easy it is to prosecute. I would have said that's probably, I don't know, about. I can't see it in one point nine, I really can't. Right, but I would have said it's at least one point two D. But it could have been just a tiny one. Right, but it could have been one point two D. Yeah, and they didn't bury it back because it's somebody's run. It's all block paint down. You know what I mean? But it could have been trenched. You could have put a trench block in. In there, you could have put some shutter and support in there, right? And it's unfortunate, but that's what the utility companies do all the time, right? And yeah, that's the sad thing about it. I'll see if I've got, got my trench box on there. Yeah, I could have put in something like that. I'm still struggling with the fine that the supervisor gets. I can understand his farm getting uh, the <laughs> right. 10,000 fine, yeah, okay, that's all right. Because what, what? that could that could be me now. Yeah, of course. Yeah. From my, from my own right. pocket. Right. Okay. Right. This is what I'm trying to. This is what we're here trying to teach. You, right. So, and what would you have been prosecuted under? Uh, uh, under? You mean under what law? Do you mean? There you go. Hang on. Look. I'm just going to bring it back up. Employees' duties. To take reasonable care of themselves and others who may be affected by their acts or emissions. Regulation 7 of the Health and Safety of Work Act. I'm working, I'm, I'm, I'm working as an agent of my company. Yeah, but you, but if you're going to try and say to me, I'm self-employed, right? 
No, let's not even say self-employed. I'm directly employed by that company. Yeah. So I'm an agent so, of that well, company. So you're so, an employee. So you're an employee. Yes, 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 And what you've just done is not take reasonable care of yourself or others that may be impacted by your actual condition. Right? Okay. And you're in breach, right, of Section 7, because you've dug the trench. Right? If you're saying I'm a subby, you're in breach of Section 3. If you said on that doesn't apply to me again, you come back to here, Section 2, this is where you get prosecuted, Section 2, and it'll be access and egress. That is safe and without such risk, because there's no access and egress in this part, is there? No nice set of, set of ladders or set of steps getting in there, is there? Right? Yeah, there's no emergency plan neither, you know there's, what I'm saying? There's nothing, is there? You know, no. you should have at least a ladder to get in you in there. And this is what you're doing is, when you talk to me, when you when you debate what you're doing, you're learning. Right, you're learning. It's getting into that. Because when yeah. I show you a slide, yeah. it means nothing. It's a load of crap. When you, when you talk to me and you debate and you disagree with me, you argue with me, you're learning. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right, and so if you've got questions, ask them. Right, I mean, I'd rather you did than you sit there. Because when you're sitting there just listening to me, you're taking none of it in. Yeah, knowledge pro probably on this one, because knowledge you do groundworks, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, but, we, I'm not a but again, we, we do this every day. Everything depends. I'm telling you, it depends on what kind of principal contractor you work for, what company you work for, depending on how you do a trench. Some jobs are pushed, mate. It's push, push, push. Some jobs you do it nicely, take your time on it. It depends. It depends on your program. It depends on all of that. Do you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, now you, you, you live and learn. So now it's all about safety. Don't listen to no one else. Do it the way you got to do it. Because we got we got to become a site manager. And if we know we something like that, mate, we get screwed over, not them. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Just one final question, Frank. Yeah, go on. That's all right. Yeah, go on. On that picture. Yeah. So to, the safest way to have had it and not problem the inspectors to have come and been happy with it. You have had placed their steps to get to the yeah, bottom. Yeah, yeah. we we'll cover excavations. I don't want to go in too much into it. I don't want to go too much into excavations yet. Right. Okay. I'm going to show you. Right. I'm going to show you a series of slides. This is just. This is some slides just to, just just to try and pick back up onto what we're saying. Right. And the reason I'm going to show you these slides is to show you what people do. How they react, how they do, how they do things, and who's at fault, right? And the reason I wanted to get this is about how you're learning, right? With the help and safety workout. But I just want to just pick. I've got one, one of them. I just want to pick the second one. I've got one. I just want to pick another one, and I just check it with the slides because I've got to know where they are as well. So I teach several one of these courses, and. Just about pick up a second. Right, because I've got two. And I wonder, do you see where he is? Yeah, I, I wouldn't go out there. Now, who was he in danger of? Everyone. Self. Self. Self, start with. Self, yeah. But then oh. chances are, if he fell, he would land on someone. He's gonna land. He might He's gonna land right? And he's exceptionally stupid, right? You can see how I is, can't you? Right? What trade do you think he was? Scarfolder. He's probably still fi a steel fixer. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, but Val, you got it right. He is, because you can see the genie left there in the background, right? I thought it was a scaffold, I'll be honest with you. No, I see. Scaffolders are a bit brain dead, you know what I mean? I don't, that, no disrespect to any scaffolders on the site, <laughs> on, on, on course, but they, they can be a little bit testing at times, scaffolders, right? But, you know. To, to be fair to scaffolders, I, I normally see them having harnesses on. Yeah, they don't clip them on or anything. And but, there should yeah, be a mark on the shoulder. They generally do have harnesses on, they just don't clip them on or anything. There should be a mark on the shoulder as well. <laughs> right, so that's what you generally see with, scaff um, with scaffolders. They've got to put the artists on and just walk around with it hanging around. You know, it's even more to catch them. Anyway, he's a still thing, so he's, he's the only person he's endangering is himself. But when he falls and he hits the ground, 
he's going to endanger someone else. He's going to give probably, possibly post-traumatic stress disorder to someone else who sees him and has to shovel him off the street as well. Right? So it's massively important what he's doing. He's, he's causing harm. You think, I said, well, no, it's not only your life. Because when you land in front of that seven-year-old kid who's on walking away to school, and you splat out, and they're covered in blood and guts from all you just land, just missed them, or you've actually hit impact them, and you've made them a cripple for the rest of their life. Um, still, with this case, I'm still having the same problem, uh, Frank, that he was charged and fined all these amounts of money. He's Why should his boss beca- be fined? Be- because he, I can see he hasn't got a supervisor's heart, so he's just a normal operator. He might even be a laborer. So if he's told to get up there, he gets up there. So the person that tells him to get up there is in that the person who's responsible. Yeah, right. They, they would have been charged and they would have been prosecuted as well. This is just to him, right? I, this I'm is get- just to him, and he's probably he, the reason there's no one else in there being bond is he's done that off his own back, right? They're supposed to be fixing that from the inside. And the thing is that that guy, if health is safe, if the site, if it's, they will stop it and the whole site will stop. People will lose their wage. Nobody will get, most people in construction are self-employed. Yeah. You know, so. Right, he's but, you know, get, get, you're struggling to, to, to get it, James, because you think his boss should be, boy, right, we can, I'm we can, we, we can put to get everything it. in place for you guys. And if you just totally ignore, right, we, we, we put a nice big sign up that says no smoking. Or he says, put a nice sign up, this is wet paint. What's the first thing you do is you go up and touch it. Right? If we say no smoking, the first thing you do is walk away from that area and light a cigarette up. Right? If we say don't come in no, with no drinks or drugs, you come in pissed up from the night before. It happens all the time. We can only do so much. Right? We can only do so much. Literally. Right? And... Then now, you know where we went into lockdown and everybody worked from home, i.e. this is the start of remote courses, and now it's talking about drug testing you at home. And now talking about that, they're talking about you doing drugs and drink tests when you're at home. Right? Well, in our line of work, we, we're not involved in working from home. All right, so let's get back to where we was, because I jumped around in the slides for a minute. So... If you look at it, if you look on this page, 30 G700, that's book A, obviously, right? it gives you the ideas of where you, where you can, um, what this, their sort of powers, their prosecution capabilities, and how they do. So if you're talking about inspectors, and as I say, these are all abbreviated now at the top, so it's HSE, which is Health and Safety Second Men, Environment and Health Agency, um, local authority, fire inspectors, right? They can gain access without a police warrant. The police cannot enter your premises without a warrant. Or they cannot enter your premises without suspicion. They can, right? The HSC can. They don't need the help of the police. They can search your premises, right, without a warrant. And anything they find is evidence against you. The police can't do that. The HSC can. Right. They can investigate accidents and incidents, dangerous occurrences. They can interview any, any, anyone they choose and take statements. But the police can't do that without recording it, without having access to solicitors and things like that. They've got massive amount of powers, huge, great amount of powers. They can take samples. They can take materials away. They can siege things. So they can say that piece of plant is really dangerous and we want to take it off site. They can do that. They have that sort of power. And you can see, as I say to you, in normal criminal law, you're innocent to prove and guilty. In health and safety law, it's the other way around. It does carry a lot lesser sentence, but you can see the powers they have and what they can do. Right? So they can initiate prosecutions. I would say, they can say to me, they can say, I need a room and I need, I need lighting, heating, I need canteen facilities, I need somewhere to use for toilets and I'm going to set up an office on site and I need that, I need it on tomorrow. And 
you have to supply it. And they can stop it. And immediately, if you interfere with it, mate, you fail from that scaffold, that would then be immediately cordoned off. And if you interfered with that, you're in interfering with a crime scene. Because someone's responsible, i.e. he was, and that's why he got fired. And, you know, he's immediately, he's possible with them. What the hell is he doing up? The site manager said, what the hell is he doing up there? He should have never been out there. And he's copped it, and he said, oh, I'll, I'll take the blame for it, I'll this out. But he's also got a large fine, and he got a potential custodial sentence. It was suspended, but you can see how hard they treat him. Uh, currently, the fees for the intervention, you will need to know that for your XA6 book, is £163 per hour. It must be repaid within 30 days of input. £163 per hour charge. So when they say, oh yeah, I'll just send you an email. About £163. Coming my way because he just borrowed an email across to you. Not me. When he says, oh yeah, don't worry, I'll drop your line. I'll send you that. £163. When he says, I'll give you a phone call, and he sat chatting on the phone to you for two hours. Another £163 for two hours, bro. Another two hours. So that's what, uh, £326 for two hours chatting on the phone to you. Uh, they, they, it's a slight drop because of COVID, but previously they made £35 million, right, in 2021. Right, 2021 it dropped to £27 million. But in the previous year, so 1920, the like, so not 2019 to 2020, they made 35 million. The average fine in that time was 145,000. In 2021, it was 107. You've got to remember that's COVID. We tend to use, or I tend to use, all figures prior to COVID because COVID has made an absolute mockery of any figures we do. All right, so. Offences, what we kind of look at the offences, the lower court, it's unlimited fine, 20,000 in Scotland, and up to one year's imprisonment. Higher court is unlimited fine, and up to two years' imprisonment. Right. Breach of section 7, which is what you were talking about earlier, the lower court is unlimited fine. Right. Section 7 is, in, you know what section 7 is? It's your own health or anybody else's, yeah? So that's when we're talking about you doing something wrong, which you don't like, James. Unlimited fine. 5,000 in Scotland, you better move to Scotland for <laughs> right? And one year in prison, right? But you do get Xbox in prison, so... Or the higher court is unlimited fine and up to two years in prison. So you do get Xbox and Sky in prison. So, so, so. Section A, obviously, this is the public. So this is the kid throwing the life boy into the pond, interfering... Right, interfering, right, lower court, unlimited fine, one year imprisonment, higher court, unlimited fine, two years in prison. Right, so you say, again, and then when you're looking down here, it's um, section 9, you're not too worried about it, but it's um, section 2, you know, regulations, it's, yeah, it's going to be a whole year, so you go, go to corporate ones, which is 36, Five years disqualification or 15 years disqualification. So they stop them running a company for 15 years. They can take more. You don't need to make a note of these. Don't need to make a note of any of this, right? Because it will not be, you'll not be questioned. The only one you're going to get questioned on is that sort of unlimited fine. And it's in the XA6 XA book. It's the unlimited fine company. So you won't need to make a note of any of the others. Please don't. Yeah, you because know, it's just wasting the time. Look at this one. This one. This Qualification one. can get only the company? Ah, no, 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 no. Look, there you go. Section seven. Right, five thousand yeah. pound in Scotland, unlimited fine, one year in prison, lower court. That's magistrates. Yeah, but you, but this is in prison. How about the, the disqualification? Employer can get. Uh, sorry, employ sorry, sorry. I didn't. I misunderstood you. Disqualification is for the directorship. Limited company, right? Okay. So, so, right. The next one, right? So, sorry, my I, I misunderstood what you were saying there. Sorry, I was just my mistake. Lost so, in translation. Uh, disqualification. Yeah, no, lost in translation. Disqualification is actually so. If you're a CEO, right? Can you imagine being the director of um, or CEO of IBM or um, 
British Rail, or, uh, I don't know, um, Transport for London, being disqualified from running that company for 15 years. That's, how their, career, that's their career is finished. That's how serious this can Career ending. Get. Right, that's how serious this can get. Now, they will cover it in some way, right? Because you probably know people you work with who've been disqualified for drink driving, and the company covers them in some way for a certain amount of time because they try and help them, right? Because they don't want to lose them. If somebody else picks them up, drops them off, or they give them jobs that's local to their home or something like that, it happens, right? It does happen. And but 15 years is a long time. Five years is a long time. You know, when you've got, when they want someone to carry a can, they pick a lower director and they say he will carry the can, <laughs> and he will be disqualified. Don't worry, we'll give you a load of shares instead, and it'll be a shareholder. So they do get away with it. But right? this next slide brings it home to truth, because this is what we were so, talking about. Just quickly, just to take you back on that one. So yeah. it's actually individuals here we're talking about, 15 yeah. years disqualification. So not, say, HZ construction company. No, no, no. This is, this is when you talk about disqualification, this is, you can't take away the company because you'll be making other people unemployed. Oh, but you okay. can disqualify them from being a director. Oh, Again, right. it's, 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 that's more for the director's course if you're going to do it. You know, that's more for the director's course. It's, 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 you don't have to worry about it. They, they publicly shame them as well. They make them take out ads in newspapers and say what a bad company we've been. And publicly, publicly shame themselves. Right? So they do, you know, they make the co company take out, say, like a million pounds worth of publicity to say, you know, and they're going every, every paper for like seven days or something like that. What a shit company we are and what we've done now. We've done. So when you see that in the paper, you now know why it's there. Because this is the courts, it's a court step. It's, it's called public humiliation, especially for environmental. Environmental offences are always higher, which really shocked me, <laughs> than health and safety ones. Yeah, because environment is more, obviously more important, I suppose. Uh, this one here, this one's called SAD, really, and it, it does bring it home to true. Right? The company basically is, the long and short of it is they, they were. They were doing some renovations on a block on a block of flats, right? Uh, and they were getting the furniture up in. So what they done is they said to, them, "Oh, we need to get this sofa up, and it's three stories in the air, and we'll lift it up, we'll just pull it up." Right? And he said, "Yeah, no, we give you a lift and get you a, a sofa lift for eight hundred and fifty quid." And they went, "No, it's all right, we'll just pull it up." So what they're doing is they're pulling it up. It's an old Victorian building. They're pulling it up on ropes. The ropes are leaning against the balustrade of the, of the balcony. That's given way. It's collapsed. It's pulled the two guys oh. down onto the floor, and they've fallen six metres to the death. 19-year-old. He's, no, so he's two Polish nationals. One was 22, one was 29. One died instantly as soon as he hit the floor. The other one died later on. Possible. 115 kilogram sofa, six, six meters in the air, should never have happened. 22 year old was pronounced dead at the scene. The 29 year old was taken to central London hospital with a critical condition for the dark lanes. The company firm was found guilty of breach of section 2.1 of the Health and Safety Work Act and received a 14 month prison sentence for each death to run apparently, so that means they're not. 14 months tops, which in today's, he would probably only do seven months. He was also barred from being a company director for four years. The company had gone into liquidation, and since he is, despite previously having, having an annual turnover of 9.7 million, he's found guilty of two counts of corporate manslaughter, two breaches of Section 21 of the Health and Safety Work Act. The company was on £1.2 million pound for each debt and 650,000 HSE breaches, all of which applies concurrently. You also have to pay £72,000 costs. Because they've gone on the liquidation, what's the chance that they got any of that paid? No. Really sad. Two guys, two labourers, dead. 
850 quid. Can you imagine having to make that bank? Imagine having, oh, by the way, this, you know, you might even, it might, well, let's call him Fred. You might have, Fred, you went out drinking with it uh, after work, or Fred, you got a lift home with, or, or Fred, you gave a lift to. And you had to make that bank call to his missus. Or so I didn't drop him home a lot because he's dead, by the way. Yeah. It's, as site managers, we have to do, we have to protect other people, especially at the lowest. Uh, and that's the site labourers and, and the people at the bottom of the chart. Yeah? And another question that I'm seeing re in relation to this article. So you have to provide training. Yeah. Instruction, training, and, and instruction. Supervision. But then these because guys, were po they were Polish, and the sign, did, it, it says here, they, they couldn't speak English. Yep. And so the documents have not been translated. Yep. But how can you translate in all possible languages of people that will turn up for work on your side? You should not accept them in the first place. Thank you. That, well, 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 no, hang on. I'm sorry, <laughs> don't, don't, no, sorry, I don't mean that. I'll take that one back. Who said that? <laughs> you was. You can't discriminate. Yes. You can't discriminate. You can't, I mean, they've been caught so quickly. You can't say that. Right? You can translate it for them, right? Because generally you'll never ever get one Polish, right? You might get a Latvian or a um, Slovakian or you might get a Russian or you might get a... Someone will generally speak the lingo, right? And you can get them to translate for you, right? You can get translation materials, right? So if you do anything, you can copy and paste and put into a document and translate into Russian. Right? Somebody turned on transcript earlier because they might have been struggling with how I speak. Right? That, don't do the transcript because it, it brings up some really strange stuff. I tried it when I was struggling to hear it. It, it, it wasn't it any good. It brings up some really strange really stuff. Strange though, stuff yeah. <laughs> really strange stuff. Really strange stuff. It sounded at some stage like you were telling a love story. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. but yeah. So don't use the transcript. I don't. I don't write the transcript very much. But what I'm to say to you is, you are legally obliged to make sure they understand and read and understand that risk assessment. That's the stuff. So if you can't communicate with them, then you really shouldn't be having them on site. You need to have another way of communicating. Where it's that, that question came to my mind because yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm African, I'm from Kenya, yeah. and I don't think you'll find, I've, I've ever seen anything translated to any of my languages. Yeah, but um, Kenyans, are, right, Kenyans, I would say, right. you, would, uh, you are generally English speaking. No, yeah. am I right or wrong? Well, no. That, that's true, but yeah. that's only for someone who's going to school. Yeah. But you could still have the skills to work on a construction site yeah. via strict experience. Yeah. So if you were to end up in this country, that's what uh, I've yeah, been wondering yeah. about. Yeah. That. I, yes. I, I, I get what you're saying. I do get what you're saying. Let's yeah. see. Well, I'm just trying to look at the word and I'm looking at Alan's. Because uh, yeah. if you look at now, CSCS cards are done in every language now. So really yeah. true, you have to accept everyone now. It's not one of them ones. It's no. It's a it, just depends, it depends on your it depends on the site manager if they're already there and are too lazy to renew bond years. Others here, I'm not saying who that was, but I think you're talking about me, Frank. Have I found oh, okay. I, I, I think I've got the gist of it. I know he was in prison. So okay. I don't leave that, right? It's a very anyway. sensitive subject, mate. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, but as long as you renew you know, there's a good salary to be earned. There's a good salary to be earned on it. And an engineer like him, he can, he can go and earn £100,000 a month in Dubai. A hundred grand a month because he's got an engineer. I worked in there for wow. six months and I speak Arabic. There you go. Wow. Yeah. That, oh, really? That, that's really tax good. Tax-free, mate. Yeah, yeah tax-free. Did, yes. did I not mention tax-free? No one women in school, oh. eh? And <laughs> what about when you come back here? Will you pay tax yeah. or that's it? No, no, you don't. No, no, no. Wow. Right. But, but anyway, is... yeah, you know, that, that's the sort of money, you know, when you, as I say to you, when you're chartered, and you come up to charter ship, you, you can earn some shitload of money in places like that. You know, that's 1.2 million a year. 
And are we on the path to get chartered or chartered engineers we're talking about? No, 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 no. He, he's got an engineering degree. Oh, okay. He's got an engineering degree. I don't it's know not chartered time. managers, is it? I, I don't know, but no, site it's managers it's... Are site managers can earn a lot more than that out there if they're on the right sort of site. Okay. Right? It depends what you want to do and where you want to chase the money. Right? Yeah. And it's just about putting in some work. But even in London, we were just, we were just talking about sort of rates there. You can earn a minimum of 250 a day, a minimum, you know what I mean? 300, 350 a day, but you've got to put in the work. You've got to get there, you've got to get to that stage in the first place. Right? And the reasons you've got to do it is because of what we are talking about, health management systems here. Right? So management, well, I've mentioned this to you two or three times today, right? it's the management rec. So we've got the Health and Safety Sorry. Work Act, the big global act that covers every single workplace every employee with the exception there is a couple of exceptions it does not co cover domestic servants which i don't really understand that all right it don't cover domestic servants it doesn't cover the forces so that's the air force the army the navy all right but and you would say to yourself why does it not cover domestic servants i don't know is it long and short there it's because it's probably been written by law and call. So anyone working for the king as a butler is not covered by the health and safety work act. I know. Strange, isn't it? Right, every other workplace it covers every single one else, everyone else. So when we do any work, right, so we're protected by the health and safety work act, that's what that's what looks after us. How we manage the health and safety work act is the management regs. So this is the one, is slightly under the act, if you like. This tells us how to interpret and how to work with the health and safety worker. So the management regs, regulation free, employers and self-employed person must carry out a risk assessment covering both workers and others who may be affected by their work and their business. So there you go, right? That's what you were talking about earlier, right? You have to do a risk assessment before you do any work. And it's affected by your work or others. Right? Clearly, that's regulation three. Right? Employers who employ five or more people should record the significant violence in the risk assessment. Assessment should be suitable and sufficient and actions should be taken to manage the hazards that are proportionate to the risk. That's the most important one of the management regs, definitely, 100%. And then when we look at that again, this was another question down here about principles of prevention. Where would you find it? Do you remember? It was one of the one of the exam questions you had this morning, principles of prevention. So when we look at a principle of prevention, the biggest one we can do there, the very, very first one is we're looking at, is avoid the risks where possible. The best way to eliminate the risks is to avoid it. Don't do it. 100%, always, isn't it? Uh, so if you've got a risk, say you've got to clean them windows up there, the best way to not, you know, on that building what we've shown you earlier, or you've got to get down into that trench like I was showing you earlier, the best thing we can do is avoid it. So if you don't have to get down there, if we can do the work remotely, if we can have mate you on the ground floor with a big long pole to clean the windows, or if we can have the basket lowered and they can clean the windows that way, that's the best way of getting around the risk, isn't it? So we avoid it. That's the avoid. If anything you take from this one, take avoid. Right? So down here, avoid the risk where possible. So that's the general principle of prevention. If you can't avoid it, so get that one into your head, avoid it. Right? If you can't avoid it, we evaluate the risks, and combat and source. We adapt the workload to individuals, adapt to technical processes, right? Develop code overall protection. Give protective measures priority over individual protective measures. Does everybody understand that one? That means we put up we give up, put up scaffolds instead of giving harnesses. Right? So harness only works for one person. Collective is when we put up the scaffolding, it works for everyone on, who, who needs to get up there. So that's a collective over an individual. And give appropriate instruction and training to employees. Always. 
So that's the principles of prevention. And when we do anything, we have to design things to we, we incorporate the principles of prevention always. So when we look at that window up there, we've got to say to him, you know, when we're cleaning that window, could we put on tilt and turn hinges so we can just open the window up inside and clear it from the inside? You know, they have to make appropriate arrangements, yeah? The risk assessment has to be conducted for every single thing we do. Absolutely every single, every single thing we do. Right? It's what we need to do. It's, it's some, some of our laws are, are, are British. Um, I live in the UK and we've got some of the, you know, as, as a British person, as, as someone from the UK, I, I like to say we've got some of the highest standards in the world. Right? We, we employ someone like Louis Bosch and Oyosh are two of the greatest standards. And when people like from Dubai, we get people from Dubai coming over here just to get our certificates. You can't take this course remotely from Dubai. You have to come here to do it. This is how, and they say, I've had people from Dubai working, coming here and doing these courses. And they say, I've got to do the course, I've had to come over here for the week to do it, because they went, can't do it. Even though it's a remote course, you're not allowed to do it. So you be one there. You can do the Irish one from there. And we get people doing our constructions MVQ. A couple of you said that you're on it already, aren't you? Um, the MVQ level six, level five. They come over here to do it, because, or they, they can do it remotely from other countries. They do that because our standards are high. Now, someone like Allah might tell me your standards are shit because, because he's, 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 he's spent more time than other countries, you know what I mean? Or, or someone like Nigel or Oz might turn around and say, no, your standards are really crap, really, compared to France and Germany. But, you know, I don't know, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. Can't hear you, can't hear you, brother. Press your space bar. If you press your space bar, it allows you to talk. Sorry, yeah, as you said, in Dubai, it's all British standard health and safety. It's mental, isn't it? It's yeah, it's, 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 it's unbelievable how they... And the thing is, when you have a degree or you have any qualification from British, you already take president on anybody else. President, you're in. Look, yeah, like, yeah. And, and, and it's mental. But do you know, if you've got a degree in this country, yeah. if you've got a degree in this country, like an engineering degree, like I've got to pick on but like an engineering degree, right? and he went to work in France, he would have to have an engineering master's degree or he wouldn't be accepted, right? Mental, right? He went to Australia or Canada, he would have to have a license to practice. See, so they dimis diminish our degrees a little bit, but our health and safety standards take the precedence at the top. They've got another one in the States, which is similar to OIOSH, but it is adapted most of our occupational health and safety practices anyway, because we've been doing it for 200 odd years. And one thing we do do well here is legal. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You, you, sorry, you're talking, Frank, but it's, uh, I went for a job. I literally was there for four weeks in, uh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. And you would think Germany, with the with, with the technology they have, you would think yeah. they improved. You know, you could people actually go and have a beer in their break. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, well, you know, PPE is nothing. You walk on site. Honestly, people working around with trainers, and nobody says right. anything. Literally, it, it's, you would not believe it. You would think Germany, and you yeah. know, I understand. know you're shocking. You, everything you're saying right now, I'm shocked. Honestly, yeah. you would not believe it. You would, yeah. you would actually, if you go to Germany, I, I literally was uh, just when COVID kicked off. I went in there because I was uh, I was doing a data center, and uh, we had to go to a data center in Germany, and I couldn't believe it. And I was going, and then you go outside and you go, well, "What's going on in here?" And he just goes, "No, it, this is the way they do it here." And you see, now I'd, I'd have thought that was like that in Spain, but I wouldn't have gone for Germany. No, the site, maybe the, to be honest, maybe the site I went to, yeah. maybe the company I was uh, yeah. swapped for, but. Yeah. Uh, when, when I went to Germany, it was absolutely the same. Whenever they deliver you the spider crane, they're just showing you how to drive it and just leave it with, with it. Then the same with the forklift, no PPE, nothing at all. So I completely agree with Spare. Yeah. yeah, but you, you see, England was like that. If you go to the 80s, 
we go to the 80s and 90s, which we will discuss a little bit later as well, you go to the 80s and 90s, it was like that. It was exactly the same now. Yeah, but it's unbelievable because you've got yeah. countries like Dubai trying to bring their standard in health and safety and you've got countries it's like, like Germany, yeah. you know, yeah. You know, uh, uh, countries like Germany were supposed to be, you know, you would think actually when you win there, you think they're going to be even, you know, better yeah. than us. You yeah. would assume it, but actually there's nothing. Yeah, oh, and, yeah. It, and, it, and it is mental, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. But they take a lot of it from us, you know what I mean? And then you've got, you've got three countries or four countries here. You've got England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, right? And the Scotland, right, so England does its laws, which cover Wales. So Wales says, well, we don't need to do any more paperwork. Let England do it and we just adopt it. Yeah? Yeah. Right? Northern Ireland has its own practices. Because Northern Ireland, if we said to, if you said to Northern Irish, it's sunny outside, they go, no, it's not dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> right? If you it's said, it's, it's, done. it's raining, it's like, no, no, no. It's not yeah. sunny. No, it's, it's been. You know, they will do anything to disagree. Right? And the Scots will do anything to upset the apple cart, right? So the Scottish will not accept titles, but they take them, put their own logo on it, and call it the Scottish Health and Safety Act, right? Even if it's copy and paste. <laughs> copy and paste is, is uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't really say that, but it, it, is, it is true. They do change some of the filing systems, right? Because they're yeah. tight, right? Yeah. But apart from that, they do all the things a little bit, but not much, oh. right? The Irish agree with most of it, but yeah. they like to, uh, they just say, well, actually, you're not governing us and we will do this our <laughs> way, right? And the Welsh just say, fuck it, let them do the paperwork, you know what okay. I mean? Yeah. And that's the way it is. But we've got four countries all so close to each other yeah. and can't agree on one okay. policy, right? It's absolutely <laughs> mental. So then, but then when you go to France or Germany and places like that, they adopt certain principles of us, but it's like the management regs. This was brought in because of a directive, uh -oh. an EU directive, right, about how we're going to manage our health and safety. But the health and safety come from us in the first place, you know what I mean? We, we send it over and they said, what? But this is how you're going to manage it. So um, so we brought in the management breaks because it, it, it was a way of us helping people comply with it. Because when you're looking at a legal document, as I say to you, I don't know how long it is, 160 odd pages, it's quite complicated. But one thing we do do well in, in the UK is law. We do it very, very well. Right? But, you know, so that's that's where we come to. So when we look at, when we go back to this management breaks, we're looking at the principles of prevention, as I say, we design anything, we do anything, we've always got to avoid it if we can. I don't plan the thing, put things right high up. We need to just evaluate the risk that we can't eliminate it and put in control measures for it. Right? We've got to make appropriate arrangements, effective planning, organisational controls and monitoring and review, protective and preventive measures, wherever possible. Right? House surveillance. This is something we don't come across really. Regulation said we don't come across it. Well, why? Because we're construction. We're, we're pretty dynamic, and we're fast moving. Right. So we don't generally get house surveillance. Most of the guys that you work with, you work with for. I don't know. What's it taking to do, um, a distribution centre? How long does that take? Well, know, so time. it depends. So in every Amazon now, we hit in yeah. fastest job in Europe. So. The last one is about a year. Yeah. And that's within, yeah. within FITAP. that's it, in a year. And it, it, well, say so you never see them again, but you probably will see them again because they do take a lot of the guys with them to the next job and they do move about with it. Yeah. But generally, when you build, build something, you construct something, that's it. Them guys are gone and you might see them again in two or three years' time. Yeah. Or another job that's closer than that area. Yeah. But generally, that's what happens. So house surveillance, we don't come across a lot. And it's not something we do long term. Why we don't do it long term? If you was working in, in say like IBM, you would have house surveillance, right? If you was working in somewhere like um, Associated British Ports or something like that, um, you would have house surveillance. If you were working on Eurotunnel, you'd have house surveillance. Why? Because you're there constantly all the time. You're an employee, right? 
Uh, but in constructions, we don't send, generally see it too much. If you, you you might have a lead company, they might employ house surveillance or an asbestos company that put work for you. They would employ house surveillance, right? But you generally don't. So, uh, competent people, regulation seven. Well, they should always have the skills, the knowledge, aptitude, attitude, training, and experience. Right? So it's, we use the acronym SKATE. Right, because that was one of the questions in your XA6 books, and I've just given you the answers, although CITB misses the payout for some reason. I don't know why we do, but we always use it as skate, which is skills, knowledge, aptitude, attitude, because they've got to have the right aptitude and the right attitude, the right training and experience to go forward. Before we carry on, go and have a cup of tea, 15 minutes, cup of tea, to follow events present serious and imminent dangers such as fire explosion or anything else well we do that when you have a, have a site induction they always give you an induction about how you're going to get out there in the event of emergencies that's what they're doing it's part of the management regulations yeah it's what they do to put provision in it's emergency procedures it's a management reg that, that makes them do it that's the only thing that makes them do it. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. Right? So it's the management regs there, seriously in danger. Contact with external services. Right? You'd think that wouldn't be reportable. It is. Right? It is 100%. I've got a lovely little video I'll show you later. With it. It's uh, where they hit it, where they hit the emergency services, and you think, Jesus, mate, you're dead. You know. There's lots of ways to protect yourself. We'll cover it when we do excavations. I'll pull up the little video for you and you'll see. Right. Employers' duties. Employers must make available to employees information on risks identified by the assessment, precautions taken, evacuation procedures, and risk arising from shared premises. Right. Cooperation and coordination. It's one of the well, two of the things. Right. Cooperation and coordination. It's what we have to do. We have to do that with everyone we work with. I know you, you think it's subjects we don't have to do it. Ed, if you Ed, Ed, right? I see you taking photos, right? I've got, got a problem. And I have got... And it's like, no, 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 no. No, right? I, I'll show you I'll show you why I've got a problem. It's because... Okay. Right? Because what you're trying to do... It's hard to get on that. Hang on, let me just bring it up. What you're trying to do, when you come to exam... You're trying to catch go on your phone to look at your um, photos. No, 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 I just no, 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 listen, 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 listen to me, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a thing here, right? I'm going to share my desktop with you so you can see me, right? Because a lot of you are not computer literate, right? So you can see me now what I'm doing, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Right, I'm going to do here. This is something because I'm on a normal word processor. I'm going to go skip into it, right? Now, I'm just going to move them over to the side. And I'll just go new, and I'll go like that. And then I can save him. Okay. Right? Sorry. I'm trying to move it, I can't. Because of your pictures up there. Right? So I'll save him, and I can save him as, I don't know, Frank one. If you like. Yeah, sweet. Right? And you can keep that, and he'll be there. And yeah. I'll flick through then. In the exam, as much as I want. Okay, yeah. I'll let my notes. Uh, Frank, I, I was going to say, Sorry, any, uh, any yeah. chance that we can actually get your, uh, uh, the, the, the program you're using, what's it called? Uh, um, PowerPoint. The PowerPoint, yeah. Give uh, us these the SNP tool. The SNP tool is available for you in there. No. Right? The PowerPoint is mine, and I wouldn't share it with you anyway. I just, uh, I just took a picture because I've seen... Just I was just on that uh, on that question with regulation. Yeah, yeah no, no. I'm, I'm trying to help you. I wanted to write it down. Yes, I'm please. trying to help you. Why don't you write it down? If you start <coughs> this, and you could just go like this. By the way. New there, and go, and call it save, and I'll call it S S T S one. But that will be so many pages, wouldn't it? Because you're clicking. Yeah, how many, how many are you going to get? How long is it taking you to flip through photos? 
it's a lot easier. It's a it's a it's, lot easier yeah. than you flicking through my slides because it would be so much quicker. Excuse me. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you. It'd be so much quicker. If you do the snippet, you can take whatever slides you want from wherever you want. And you're going to end up with what? 50 slides, 50 photos, 25 photos, 30 photos? Well, with the, same click, 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 click. With, with the same success, they can make a screenshot onto the paint and just yep. save it afterwards. Yeah, yes, they can. Yeah, they can. Yeah, not everybody's got word. That's the problem. But... Yeah, you should have a snippet, and again, if you're Apple, it might be totally different. Again, the reason why I, I, I ask, uh, Frank, is yeah. because me personally, the way I learn is read, yeah. like, say, the, if, say, for instance, regulation 9, contact with ex external services, regulation 10, employees' duties. Back to employees again, right? So, sorry, regulation 10. Employers use. Employers must make available to employees information on risks, precautions, evacuation procedures, and risk arising with shared premises. Regulation 11 is where we're talking about cooperation and coordination. Right? So it's where we've got more than one contractor, more than one occupier of premises. So when you're sharing premises, and a lot happens quite a lot, you have to share. What you're going to do, the emergency escape routes, the emergency fire plans, the explosion risks, the fire plans, the health and safety plans. You know, you've got to coordinate with one another and just say, we're going to work together as a team. I know people don't like to do that in construction, and that's what we should be doing. Regulation 12 is about working in host employees. 13 is capabilities and training. So that's competent operators. Right? We must have competent people in what we do. When we're talking about skills, knowledge, trainings, and everything else, what we've mentioned before. Regulation 14 of the management regs is the employees' duties, and I'll just bring it back up to you. Mm. So let's share the screen. Share the screen, please. Yeah. Right. Employees' duties, you should be able to see that one. Let's move it over there. Every time I move you around, I employees should use equipment and substances in accordance with any training and instructions given by the employer. Instructions, training, knowledge, experience, competent guys. Competent is not certificated. Certificated means you've got past the test. Competent means you actually capable of doing the job. Right? Two totally different things. Right? Because you will get I do like to bring that one into the exam. It causes quite a lot of reviews. Competent is what we want in the time. Certificate means nothing. Right? So, employers of their appointed representatives of any health and safety issues that may arise that present a serious and imminent danger or any shortcomings in their arrangements of health and safety. Temporary workers. You guys are temporary workers, I'm like, because most of you are subbies. Is anyone actually here employed? No one. No one employed? Yeah. Uh, I'm employed. You are? Yeah. Yeah. Who's that? James? No, Adrian. Adrian, yeah. yeah there's not many people employed in construction. It's, yeah, it's just the way it is, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's sad, but... Again, we cover it in stress and mental health like one as well. New and inspecting mothers. Have you ever seen any of them on site? Anyone got any women on their side? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah engineers, yeah, you would have, wouldn't you? I'm uh, going to so. be, let's keep it polite, but yeah, they're really good. Yeah, but you would have engineers, you'd have engineers women, women have gone into a lot of the engineering roles. Yeah, yeah. No, no, to be fair, site management and uh, a lot of QSs are women. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big, yes. Big, big. I know, yeah, I know, yeah. I know a lady which was back in 2014. She was working for a main contractor in Taiwan, and she went to Australia for multiplex. Mm -hmm. So she was quite good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah look, you don't see many of them, do you? We're not got into that. We're not got into that section of the industry where you're being um, sort of 50-50 or yeah. You know, 
Yeah. But in the last few years, it changed a lot. Before, it has when I changed started, a lot. It has changed. When I started, it, changes, it changes. I try to say to you guys, it changes different parts of the country, right? You guys work in London, or, or a majority of you work in London. How many on your sites have got prayer rooms? Sorry? How many of your sites have got prayer rooms? Flo- What's prayer, that? prayer rooms? Prayer, no, prayer no, rooms. we haven't got a no, I can't remember. Prayer rooms. A prayer room. Prayer rooms. In every site we have a prayer room. There you go. See? Right? There every you go. Every site yeah. we have a prayer room. Yeah, yeah we've got as well. Yeah, you. There you go. But that's what I'm saying. Up in London, you'll see that. Down here in the south, you won't see that. Not at all. To be honest, I've never oh. been to them. Yeah, but, you know, you won't see that at all, right? It's because, I don't know, you know, we've got less people who want to pray, I suppose. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know, right? It's just, you know, if we said, if we said on, you know, when we did project management on a job and we say, oh, where's this prayer room? They'd laugh at us, you know, because it, it just doesn't happen, right? But, and then if you go to the West or the Midlands, right, you'll find nearly everyone on site is Asian. Right, nearly everyone. Right, and down here in the south, there's hardly any agents. Right, it's totally, totally different. Depending on what area you work in the country, depending on where you work, and you know, you you guys are mainly in London. So you only know London, and this is why when we speak to someone like you, Bob, uh, who's travelled around a bit, or Andre, when you you've travelled around a bit, it's good because you get some perspective well, on how yeah. other people's doing. If I need to be honest, I can say that for for the bigger main contractors, they making those players rooms, yeah. because I have been on the jobs from very north to very south, yeah. uh, Wales, and uh, if I need to be honest, the, let's say the top twenty main contractors, most of them they've got more facilities than the rest, mm-hmm. so I don't think it's that much from where the the, the location of the project is. Yeah. It mainly depends on yeah. the main contractor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Main contractors will mirror what they do across the country. They can't they, they wouldn't dare do what they they wouldn't do dare do something if Barrett's were doing something in Scotland, they would do exactly the same in England, do exactly the same in Wales. Like they wouldn't dare drop one from one part of the country. But it's like construction sites. What I'm saying is if you go to London, you'll see on certain sites they've got prayer rooms and things like that. Whereas if you go to Wales Wales is a massively, massively, massively huge religious place. I know. Yeah, right. If you go I, to I've been on a couple of jobs in Cardiff, so I know. If you if you go if you go to their holiday camps, they have churches on their holiday camps. Right? They do. You go to a holiday camp in Wales and you'll see a church in there and think, look, there's a church here. Because they, they were very, very they call it nineteen because it's under the age of nineteen. They generally say we haven't got the understanding of what we're doing, or the knowledge or experience, and they, there's a potential danger of them getting injured. But the management regs, as I say to you, that's just a, you know that's the that's the one. If I was going to screenshot one, but it, it, it's not needed. You won't need it. The most important one in the reg, in the regulations is Regulation Three about risk assessment. Mm. HSG 65. We mentioned it earlier. Right, you will get a question on this. They do like this, right? And perhaps the next slide or that one is the one you're going to get questioned. Now, you've seen these pictures. They're on the front of your books, right? Now, the question will be, right, generally, please put this in, in the correct order, starting at check. What are the other three Stages, so it's check, act, plan, do. Right? That is as hard as it gets for them. Literally, as hard as it gets. So that's what I'm trying to say to you. If you don't know, it's on the front of your books. If you've got legal and management, it's right on the front page of the book. Right? So it starts on plan, always. It then do check and act. Right, so if we go back to this HSG 65, what is HSG 65? It's a management system devised by the health and safety executive. It means we should plan everything we do. We should determine our policy and plan and, and how we're going to implement it. We'll 
do with a risk profile. We organise the health and safety implemented plan. We check, we measure performance, monitor before events, investigate after events, so proactive, reactive monitoring, and we'll analyse and review performance. This is on lessons learned, what we've learned from what we've done. So when we look at look it in a little bit more detail, planning, right? We think about where we are now. Where do you want to be in the future? Say what you want to achieve. Who will be responsible for it and how we're going to achieve it, right? What we want to achieve, how we measure our success, our targets, our objectives. You may need to write down a policy and your plan and how you're going to deliver it, right? This is what we do on the Plan Do Check Act. This, this is downloadable free from the agency. But you don't need to, 65 pages of gump that you're not going to need, right? So you need to know about the Plan Do Check Act system and where it is. So what you're looking at is, is your planning. You're determining what you're going to, what you, you know, what you want to achieve. Let's say, right, I want to run a marathon. How am I going to achieve that? I'm going to train for three months solid. I'm going to lose a lot of weight. I'm going to get someone else to run it for me. <laughs> and I'm going to drink lots of fluid, right? That's how you plan it. How are you going to do it? Right. I will pay someone else to run the marathon for me and here's my shirt, right? And how am I going to check on it? I'm going to make sure he does his training. And then how am I going to act to the end? I'm going to review how it went. Oh, it went really well. He done really well there. He got me a good time of three hours. You know what I mean? That's it. That's the plan. And I just picked on that some nice and simple, right? So that's what we're trying to do. We're considering fire and other emergencies when we do the planning section. We've got to come, we've got to look at all potential eventualities. We've got to look at what's going to happen with the plan. Remember, we work in a dynamic industry. It changes by the minute, not by the hour, not by the day. It changes by the minute. When suddenly we've cleared, if you've ever done a job and you've cleared out one section of the corridor and you've walked away, and it's all clear, it's ready to go, you've cleared the fire exit, it's ready to go, you've gone into the other room, come back out, and somebody's stuck a pilot there, and you think, how the fuck did that happen? You know, we stuck a pilot again gear there, I've only been gone three minutes, you know, and, it, it, and it's happened, because that's what people do. We work with humans, humans are, are there to fail us, they let us down all the time, you know what I mean? But, you know, you've done it yourself, you, you, you've painted you painted a wall or you painted a handrail and somebody's come up and stuck their hand in it. You put in fresh concrete and somebody's walked through it. It's what happens. But we've got to plan for that. And what we do, we plan, we put the fresh concrete, we put barriers around it, stop it getting in the way of it. Right? So that's what we do when we plan. Right? We risk profile. Right? The do. Right? The risk profile. Organise, implement your plan. Identify your risk. Assess the risk. Put it in a priority. Prioritise what's at the top. The most dangerous has always got to be at the top. The least dangerous at the bottom, right? The least dangerous that isn't going to injure people, we can forget about. We can say, oh, we can potentially get, get very wet there. Well, let's forget about that. We're not interested in that. But the one that can cut people's heads off, we are interested. In. You know, we're going to prioritise that, put that right at the top, right? The least dangerous one, we can diminish it, get rid of it. You know? We've got to, it's about perspective. It's got to be cost-bearing as well, right? You implement your plan. You, know, you, you provide the right tools, the right instruction, the equipment, the job to keep keep them maintained. Train and instruct the people where you're doing it. It's, it ensure everyone is competent to carry out the work. Supervise it. Make sure the arrangements are followed, right? That's what we need to do on the do section. Right? On the check, we need to measure performance. Investigate accidents, incidents, near misses. Everybody leaves near misses, right? Near misses just as important. If you've got a, let's, I'm going to afford it, he's got a barrel of oil and he's driving down the road, right? And the barrel of oil, he, the forklift hits on his brakes, it rolls off and it comes over and it hits a fence and it does no damage. Talk to your driver, goes over to it, puts his forks under it, puts it back on, drives off back down the road. Or, Let's go for the same scenario. The barrel rolls down the road, hits a curb, splits, spills, and all the water runs into a river. It's now caused a major environmental da damage. Or 
the barrel rolls off, hits the curb, bounces up and knocks out a kid on the way to school. Now, of course, pose no injury. That's two reportable incidents. So the near miss is just as important as the actual incidents. Right? Because if we can prevent the near misses, we can come on to later. I say this a lot, we come on to it later, but we will come on to these things later. We we'll stop talking, James. <laughs> right? We will come on to them later, but how do we do, how do we make sure our plans have been implemented? Safety surveys, safety sampling, job analysis, um, in site inspections, accident reports, incident reports. They're all the kinds of things that we're going to learn from, right? The things we're going to review on a daily basis, right? How do we act? The last one, the act, review and performance, lesson learned. This is an iterative process, so it goes round and round. We constantly go back on ourselves. We review our we review our performance. We benchmark against other people. So we look at other organisations and how do they do it. We revisit plans and say that didn't work. It don't work, you know. So I was working 18 hours a day, but for six hours we don't get any jobs done. Or if we get all the accidents, it's cut out in six hours. You know, so we're back down to 12 hours. So you look at plans and you say, let's do it this way. We take actions on lessons learned. We learn from audits and inspections. It's irritating. It goes round and round. So that, if you're going to screenshot one, photograph it, that's the one you want, really. But it's the plan, do check out, because this is where you are now, where you want to be, who's responsible, how are we going to measure it, Plan for emergencies, plan for change. That's the plan section of it. The do, it always starts with plan. The do is identify risk profile, organise activities, implement a plan, tools and equipment, train and supervision. The check, measure performance. Andre, if you'd rather photograph it, photograph it, mate. I just, all I was trying to do was help you, that's all I'm saying. If you'd rather photograph it, photograph it. Measure performance, not just paper, not just paper trail. Talk to people, investigate the causes of the accidents, incidents. Right. Review your performance. Learn from your lessons, your audit trials, your inspections, your accident inspections, your consults. Right. It goes round and round, round and round. And when there's something go wrong, so if you get an accident here, you go back to the plan. Right. If the plan is here and you start doing it and they say it's not working, you go back to the plan. If you're checking on it and it's failing, it goes back to the plan. So if you're acting and you're getting too many hits on it, back to the plan. That's what we do. Plan, do, check out all the time. I right? say so the four words that you're going to get possibly an exam question on is plan, do, check out. Bella, have you you've done this four years ago? Have you heard? Fuck me. Yeah. Five. Yeah, five. Oh, I'm sorry, mate. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, because it makes it like I I, I no, forgot no, in four no. years. I wouldn't yeah. remember it in four years. Yeah, but do you, do you remember <laughs> this? Do you remember it or not? Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because this one, everyone HSG sixty five. If it has anything happens on your site, this is the one that we're ordering. This is the health and safety will come in, and this is the one that they will hit you with. Your yeah, risk assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But this this is the one because this is the planning is the risk assessment. Right. So this is this is where they're gonna they're gonna look at you and they say, What have you done? How do you implement it? And if you say I work to ISA forty five thousand one, they go, Yeah, we're only interested in HSG sixty five and this is the one we're gonna order you against. And if you don't match up, because ISO forty five thousand one you pay a lot of money for and they do six categories instead of four. Right. See so but it's exactly the same four, and they're just putting two more, right? And it just makes it a bit more complicated, but then it means they can charge you extra money for it. But the HSE will order you on this one, and this is why it's important, and this is why I said to you, you know, it's, it's what we do. It's called health and, health and safety management systems. So just the last before we go, right, health and safety policy, three main parts, statement of intent, what we are, where we are, our aims, our targets, and resources, and commitments, our organisation, who we are, and our arrangements. We've mentioned this earlier. I'm going to end on that one, right? Because he wants to watch football, and I am kind of a nice guy. I'm trying to be a nice guy, right? So, and you probably had enough of me talking on. Remind me where we are tomorrow, so I'll come back onto this section. 
and we'll finish these slides off. Sorry, quick question, Frank. Yeah, go on. Do you have any past exam papers? We could go through them, maybe. You, if, will if... Get, you will get an exam paper from me in a minute. I will drop you one in a second. Thank you very much. Has everybody so got word? Yes. I do, yeah. Anyone not got word? Yeah. 